Hello everyone. Welcome to build your second app with Swift UI for iOS. Uh, we're going to build a complete app from scratch today. And there's going to be a lot of code flying past very quickly. Um, but it's going to be about an app that's really close to my heart, as you'll know if you've met me in person. And that's coffee. We've got lots of coffee today uh, in our application. And the app's going to track how much coffee you drink, how many calories you consumed, and most importantly, how much caffeine was in that uh, uh, coffee you drank. Uh, the, I should say the numbers it generates are basically invented by me. Uh, so please don't try and ship my actual application um, to the App Store without at least checking my numbers carefully and you know tweaking them correctly and so forth. Otherwise, you'll be very disappointed um, because again, it's not real numbers. They are just fabricated by me. Now, uh, I have tried to simplify the code as much as I can, so it's really suitable for beginners, um, but it's not absolute beginners. Like I made a stream this time last year, how to build your first app uh, with SwiftUI for iOS. And uh, I'm basically assuming you've watched that video already. If you haven't, you'll find a link below in the description probably. If not, you will after the video. Um, watch that one first. Work your way through that one first and then crack on and use that uh, and it'll help you a great deal. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be a bit confused while we're covering today. Uh, now, along the way, because it is aimed at mostly beginners, I have made a few, uh, let's call them shortcuts, uh, just to make our life easier as we progress. Only very small, um, but it's it does make our life easier as we go through. Um, and again, if you get confused along the way, pause, rewind, watch a previous video, whatever it takes, you'll get there. Um, before I start, I should say there are various moderators in the, in the chat area who will uh, issue an instant ban on site of any harassment or abuse, anything like that. I have zero tolerance for uh, unpleasant behavior. And so any kind of inappropriate activity in there, bang, you'll just get a, a, a lifetime ban. That's it. That's how it goes. And finally, before we get into the code, uh, today is my birthday. Uh, and um, I'm spending it here live on YouTube because I want to try and raise money for charity. Uh, in particular, this year I'm raising money again, like last year, for a charity that helps folks who are experiencing homelessness this winter. And, you know, it's viciously cold out there with coronavirus and more. It's really, really grim. And so if you're here or if you're watching later on, please consider donating a small amount to my uh, charity, which is justgiving.com slash two straws. I'll put it into the chat thing over here, perhaps. Uh, justgiving.com slash two straws. That link there. Uh, and perhaps <laughs> we paste it in the future again and again and again. Um, check it out if you could. And donate even a, a few bucks would make a huge difference. Um, and even better, your name will appear in the video as we progress. <laughs> um, so you get a little a little thank you like that as we go. Um, so yes, it, it's a really important charity doing really important work. So if you can, please donate. Okay, that is the intro out of the way. I want to crack on with the important stuff, which of course is building our actual application as we go. And so, um, go ahead and launch Xcode 13.2. You don't need 13.2, 13.1 is fine, 13.0 is fine too. 13.2 is what I'm using here. Uh, and go ahead and make uh, this new Xcode project. And when it offers you some options in a moment, you can see mine's running at full laptop speed. Um, I'll move that way the chat actually while we're going. Um, hopefully you'll see some options. You want to choose iOS, then app. And I'm going to name my project Cool Beans <laughs> because it's an app for tracking coffee and coffee-like things. So choose Cool Beans. Uh, make sure you enter your interface as being Swift UI. Otherwise, this will be a very confusing tutorial indeed. Uh, then press Next. And then create it somewhere, desktop or whatever is fine. Oh, question, can I use Swift Playgrounds? Um, yeah, no, you probably can. You probably can. Um, it'll mostly work. Yeah, I, I'd be curious how it handles the uh, asset department, but yeah, you probably can. Um, now, I'm gonna try and make some space on my screen. So I've got this chat window on the right here, and that's as small as that goes. Um, so I'll try and make this as compressed I possibly can so you can sort of see as much as your chat while we go. So I do want to answer questions as we progress. And let's have the preview here on the right, perhaps like that kind of size, a bit smaller. Ah, Prathmesh, good to see you. You are on, on moderator duty along some other folks. So I'm looking forward to hopefully a nice quiet day. 
So that's sort of the most I can see in my Xcode window like that. Um, the assets you want to download for this, I'll type this into the chat window. If you've just arrived, you'll find in the in the description below the link to the assets. It is uh, HTTPS colon slash slash hws.dev slash coolbeans.zip. That thing there. Again, it is linked below in the uh, uh, video description or being well, that link is there. Um, you want to grab that and it contains a bunch of assets I want to use in this project. Mostly pictures, but also a little bit of JSON. So go and grab the assets zip file now if you could. And uh, what you want to do is you want to grab that JSON file, menu.json, and bring that into your project, you know, below content view is fine, for example. Uh, yes, copy items, yes, create groups, yes, add to targets, that's fine. And then uh, the images, all these things here are various pictures of, of beverages, hot and cold. I'd like you to add those to our asset catalog. Now, um, right chili, I guess, asked about Swift Playgrounds. Give it a try. Give it a try because um, Swift Playgrounds doesn't handle at 2x, at 3x right now, but it might just magically work because they're quite smart, those Apple bods. And so, oh, hello. Um, and so it might just work out of the box. So um, you'll find out in about five minutes. <laughs> hey, dog. Um, so what you want to do is go ahead and grab those and put them into your asset catalog. So I'll take over here and pull these files and just command A, them in. All right, have a treat. Fine. Here you go. Come on. Come on. Good girl. Right. Just grab all those and put them into your asset catalog. Badoom. Like that. And uh, that's all our assets, right? A bunch of pictures. All these JPEGs here at 2x and 3x plus some JSON. We're now done with those. They're in our project. We can move on. You can go ahead and close that finder window or delete zip file, depending on what you want to do. <laughs> Another treat, huh? Goodness me. Um, if you subscribe to my videos online, by the way, you'll see they get fed a lot of treats. Do not think my dogs are hungry. They are not hungry. <laughs> They're perfectly fine without all the extra treats. Isn't that right? Anyway, um, that's our assets done. So we'll go ahead and start pulling in bits of that into our project. And that means starting real small. We're going to just pull in a little bit of data and then add to it, add to it, add to it over time. I, I prefer to work in a sort of iterative approach just enough to get moving and then go up from there. Now in our case, sort of the center of our program is a list of the drinks that we might want to be going around tracking in our life. And so this means creating a, a new type to store one drink, you know, uh, cappuccino, Americano, cold brew, cortado, whatever, one kind of drink in our product. And so press command N, and in Xcode, preferably. Command N in Xcode. There we go. And choose Swift file. And name this thing drink.swift. One drink in our program. So press create. And there's a lot of things in that, Jason, which we're going to use ultimately. But for now, like I said, we're just going to start small. Just enough to get us up and running in our particular program. Right, you'll have more treats later on. Okay, come back later. Later. Go away. Come on, skedaddle. Skedaddle, be here all day otherwise. Come on, <laughs> down you go, cheeky mutt. Okay, so in here, one drink. We'll say there's a strut called drink. Now this thing has to conform to two protocols that can be used in our project. One is identifiable, so that SwiftUI can identify every item in our drink uniquely. It knows every drink is different from every other drink. But also, codable. So this thing knows how it can be loaded and saved from JSON. In our case, that's our menu.json file. Now, in order to conform to identifiable, you've got to at least add one property, which is an ID like this, called ID. And it can be any kind of value you like, string, integer, whatever you want to, but the most common type is a UUID. And a UUID, UUID stands for Universally Unique Identifier. And it's basically guaranteed to be unique. Of course, you can make it the same if you want to. It's not a problem, not, not, not a massive issue. But as long as you make them uh, automatically with you know iOS making them for you, they're going to be unique. The chances of a clash are extraordinarily tiny, sort of heat death of the universe level of, of, of unlikeliness. Anyway, so the idea of our drink, so it's unique somehow, 
then also a name string. What is the name of our drink we want to be showing on the screen? And again, there's more we're gonna show later on, but that's enough for now. So, really, really, you, out, go on, go, go, go on, go on, go on. She'll be back, don't worry. <laughs> so we've got our, our ID and our name thing here. And this thing, we're gonna say, yeah, ID and name, bunch of more things coming later on, but that's enough for now, just to get going. We'll also add an example value. And I highly recommend this because it makes it so much easier to preview things when working with 50 Y. So we'll say static let example be a, a drink just to have for previewing purposes. So we'll do a new UUID and a name of example drink. Oh, it's Benjamin Mayo. Benjamin, I saw your article about the Apple TV Plus stuff. That's a great idea. It's a great idea. Right to the point. <laughs> what do I actually have to watch in life as opposed to sort of everything to browse through, whatever. Straight to the point. I love it. Good job. Anyway, example data. Um, go ahead and just give me enough to preview this content in a layout here. Now, that's our first type. One drink. A level up from that, inside our menu JSON file, we have the concept of sections. What is one section in our layout? And that exists because we have a coffee section full of various kinds of coffee. Or we have a tea section with, of course, various kinds of tea, and then a cold drinks section with various kinds of cold drinks. So different kinds of drinks inside our application. And each section has many drinks inside it. So. We've got our drink struct. We'll write up around that a menu section struct that holds one section inside our menu. So again, command N, a new file. I'll call this thing menu section.swift. And this will be a new struct called menu section, which again, identifiable and codable for exactly the same reasons. So it has to be unique inside Swift UI and loadable and saveable from our uh, layout, uh, Jason, sorry. It has an ID, another UUID, and a name string. And remember, one of these things will have many drinks inside it. So each section has many drinks. So we'll say it also has a drinks array, like that. So that's one section in our larger menu. And finally, we're going to have the whole menu, which will include lots of sections, but also in the future, things like uh, what milk options we have, whether the user wants to add syrups to their coffee or similar. So we'll say, uh, make another new file. So file, call this thing menu.swift. Now this is going to be a class. The other two were structs. This will be a class, and the reason is we're going to inject our menu into the Swift UI environment so that any views inside our layouts can read the menu whenever they want to. So it'll be a class. Class menu. Now, in order to go into the environment, we have to make this thing conform to a particular protocol called observable object, which means Swift UI knows to watch this thing for any change that might happen. In our case, there will be no changes. We're loading it once, putting it into the environment and forgetting about it. But it's possible there could be at least. And so we've got to make it conform to this one protocol. It'll also be codable. Again, so we can load and save this thing from JSON. For now, the bare minimum we're going to do is say this thing has a whole bunch of sections behind it. All our menus. So that'll be coffee, tea, and cold drinks. So we'll say, let sections be an array of menu section. Now, I'm a really big fan of making my data models, my biggest sort of class things, know how to load themselves, how to work with themselves. Uh, Chris asked, do not need an example in menu section? Potentially, yes. In this case, no, we don't. There's no screen in our app that will show just one section. It doesn't make sense in terms of uh, uh, previewing purposes, but yeah. Broadly speaking, I love adding example data. It's really, really cool with UI. But in this case, it's like, eh. <laughs> it's not really previewed ever. So I'm not too worried about it. So again, uh, I firmly believe my top level data structures like this should know how to load themselves. They understand what to do. And in this case, that means adding an initializer. 
when this thing is created, it will find menu.json inside our app bundle, load it up, decode it into a menu ready to use, and then copy its values across as needed. So we'll say there's a do block, find where our file, our menu.json file exists in our app bundle. So that'd be bundle.main.url for resource, menu, JSON. So find that thing. And this must exist in our app bundle. I mean, if it doesn't exist, our app will not work. I will very happily force unwrap that. If we can't find menu JSON, the app's just gonna crash and <laughs> make sure the file's there. It isn't there, it's a fundamental logic error, don't do that. Um, pull the URL out. Now we'll load that URL into a data instance by saying that data equals try data content of that URL. So we've now got the data for that URL ready to work with. And then our next job will be to decode that into a menu. What do we actually have? So we'll say, let menu data be try JSON decoder dot decode and menu dot self from that data. And if all that has worked, if we found menu.json, if we load it into data, if we decode it into a menu, brilliant. We're gonna take its sections and put it into our sections. Sections equals menu data dot sections. Just copy it across. If anything goes wrong, if we cannot find it, if we cannot load it, if we cannot decode it, fatal error. Menu.json is missing or corrupt. I had someone recently tell me that uh, fatal error should never be used because your app should never crash. There is no sensible way of recovering our program if our menu JSON file isn't there. Uh, I think fatal error is absolutely the right thing to do. Crash loud and proud and get it fixed and then hopefully make sure a test covers it fully. That's hopefully the goal in all these things. Anyway, our menu now knows how to load itself. We'll add more here later on, but that's enough for now just to get it up and running. So we now have our menu. Our menu has menu sections. Our menu sections have drinks. That's our basic data model in place, ready to go. Uh, Prashant, can we make a failable initializer? We could do, so we could make this thing up here uh, failable and then return nil if we couldn't find the URL or return nil uh, if uh, the uh, thing couldn't be loaded or decoded, but there's no point. I mean, this must not fail. If this has failed, it means our app bundle is fundamentally corrupt. It's really, really broken. Our app should not be trying to run, just bail out. This is exactly the right place using fatal error. Okay. Uh, is there no storyboard on the iPad version? Oh, you mean um, Swift Playgrounds? Uh, well, there's no storyboards full stop these days, ideally, if you're in Swift UI land. Um, there isn't one at all anymore. And so, no, there'd be no storyboards here. Okay. Our data is, for now, good enough. We've got something to work with now, at least. We can now crack on and start actually showing things on the screen. And so, to do that, in Content View, we're going to start by... Uh, making a value here. We'll say uh, at state object, var menu is a new menu, like that. Oh, good question from Kilo. Hey Kilo, how you doing? <laughs> um, why not force try? Yeah, sure. If you want to try, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't use try expression mark that often, um, but it would mean you can remove uh, these two. I mean, broadly speaking, broadly speaking, um, it is preferable to handle errors carefully rather than using try exclamation mark only because it lets you um, handle the things when they go wrong. So rather than getting a crash in that line, you could say, oops, the decode error was yada, yada, yada. By catching the exception down here, printing out the, the JSON decoder error in more detail, key such and such was missing or whatever was missing, wrong format, I don't know, whatever the error happened to be, as opposed to just forcing the try, which will just cause a crash. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I prefer that. Uh, you'll see that in the Swift UI, we have a longer decoding thing where it you know, handles. 
key missing, wrong format missing, bad JSON missing, whatever, the, the, um, carefully all the way through the options. Anyway, uh, yeah, make a new menu in content view. Make it once using at state object. If you aren't familiar with this, uh, the state object refers to an external value, a reference type value, a class or an actor, whatever, class usually, uh, over here, outside our, our view, but created by our view, managed by our view, as opposed to created by someone else. And so this is a, 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 a class type that we want to keep alive at all costs, as opposed to observable object, which you use when someone else has made the type data and passed it over to you. They own it, they use the object there. In this case, we're creating it, we use the object here. So we've now got data behind it, we've made one of these things, and now I wanna make a view to show that data somehow, to show the actual menu on the screen, and this will be done separately in its own view right now, elsewhere. And we'll have a little shortcut in a second to show it on the screen straight away, but later on, the menu will only appear when you say, I wanna add a new drink to my data store. But it's a new Swift UI view. So we'll say here, uh, Hans asks, uh, is menu not private could use across views? Yes. So I have this thing, uh, you could say private. I don't think it's the right option um, because it'll be used elsewhere. We'll in inject it into the environment. Private will compile, but it's a bit of a misnomer. You're just confusing yourself a little bit because it's not really private. It's used elsewhere. Anyway, new Swift UI view. Command N. Choose Swift UI view. And then call this thing menu view dot Swift. And this will show our menu of options to the user. And again, we're gonna start off real simple and add to it, add to it, add to it, add to it, to make it more powerful over time. So the least this has to have is access to a menu object. Again, this will come from the environment. What is the current menu available to us? So we can say at environment object var menu menu. I was showing our coffee options in a grid because it works better across a range of devices, iPad, landscape, iPhone, or who knows what. So we'll say we've got a columns for our grid. This will be an array of, oops, one grid item using adaptive with minimum size of 150 and then no maximum size like that. Now adaptive grid items mean I don't care how many columns there are. I just want to make sure they're at least 150 points wide. And so Swifty Y will lay them out as many as it can into that space, occasionally making them bigger as needed to make sure they don't go, go below 150 points in size. So it's adaptive. It could be two per row, five per row, 10 per row. We don't care. Just that minimum size is all we care about. And now in our body, we can start to build out a basic version of our view. So I'll say we have a navigation view. Top level thing, nice title at the top. Inside there's a scroll view. And inside there, if I just hide the sidebar temporarily, I could probably bring up the preview as I'm working. So you can sort of see what we're working on. Let's use iPad 13 Pro. Badoom. And then zoom out fractionally. There we go. Uh, so the scroll view here, uh, we're gonna say has a lazy V grid inside. So a vertically scrolling grid gets inside our scroll view. And the columns will be our column layout, like that. Now inside the grid, we're gonna go over all the sections in our menu. So coffee, tea, cold drinks right now. Go over all the sections we have in there. And then inside there, give me the current section. Give me coffee, give me tea, give me cold drinks, one at a time. And now inside the section, we'll say there's a Swift UI section, which has a for each section dot drinks. The drink coming in. So a scrolling view, it's a grid of items. Go over every one of the sections in our menu, make a section for it. Inside that section, go over every drink in the section. Give me one drink in. Inside there, we'll do a V stack with 
text drink dot name. And the VStack is helpful here because we're gonna add more things to it shortly. So I'll show the drink name, and then we'll also say I want a little bit of padding at the bottom for our uh, VStack. So it doesn't get too close to other views around it. Now, we've got to add a little bit extra padding around the edges uh, so our grid doesn't quite go edge to edge. So for our lazy V grid here, I'll say we need some padding with horizontal. And then we'll add a title to our scroll view. Nav title saying add drink. So a question here, any idea in a preview error um, that uh, warning here. So it's, it's complaining because we haven't injected this environment object yet into our uh, menu view. We've asked for menu to be there. We haven't actually used it yet. And so you've got to update the preview. <laughs> I'll do that now. Menu view environment object is a new menu. Just inject it on in there. And bang, our preview springs into life, which is great. Um, so I want to br briefly mention environment object. We just use state object, which again creates a reference type object, like a class, inside the view and keeps it alive for as long as the view exists. It'll be destroyed only when the view is removed. Environment object says, I expect to find menu already made by someone else and already in the Swift UI environment. I expect to find it there. And if you're wrong, bang, your code will just crash. That's what um, Victor was seeing, if you look in the chat thing here. Um, our preview originally didn't have this line of code here. To inject the environment object into the, uh, the environment, the menu wasn't in there. And so it's looking for it and saying, there's no menu here, bang, explosion. So that will fix it out. That'll fix it very nicely by injecting it here. Uh, Prathamesh says, so much indentation. Yes, <laughs> there is indentation galore here. I am honestly thinking of switching to the same style that the Swift developers use for Swift itself and the standard library and other Apple projects like algorithms and collections, which is a two-space indent um, because it, it's much nicer for Swift UI. Um, but will it be refactoring? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I have time for that. We're building stuff here. We're just building. It's a prototype. It's fine. <laughs> anyway, there's our little layout. It's basic, but we can do better. You know, we can go ahead and make this thing a little bit nicer. We can say things like uh, our text, add a little bit of styling to it. We could say, I want to have a custom font. And I use a system font using the body as my basis for it, but with a custom design asking for a serif font. So that gives you a sort of uh, Times New Roman style uh, font state styles, styles here. So little edges on it, but it makes it a little bit nicer to read. More stylish, I think, for a coffee house. Uh, second, the reason we have these sections is because we can now add a section header to them. We can say that this section has a header behind it, and this will have a text of uh, section name, like uh, that. Um, it's a bit basic. We can, of course, style that up. We can say, I want to have the same font attached to it. So I'll do system, this time title with design dot serif. There we go. Uh, I could say it has a custom frame with a max width of infinity. So it goes edge to edge. Infinity, come on Hudson. Infinity with alignment of leading. So it goes to the left hand edge for me, like that. Uh, I could add a little bit of spacing around it. So we could say there's some padding on, let's do top, bottom, and uh, maybe trailing too, like that, of five points each. And then add a background of background, which I realize it looks confusing. What it means is get the system background color and use that for the background of this view. And that's important because it will stop other things scrolling behind it visibly. It won't overlap, say, Cortado and coffee. It'll look weird as you color in the background like that. Um, Peduran asks, would I recommend using environment object or to inject menu through constructor, through the initializer? Um, you know, it really depends. In this instance, I've tried to keep it as simple as possible, which is the environment. 
But um, I think I would make that choice in a case by case level. You know, it's not always one, not always the other. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, the menu is used at three levels. Uh, so, you know, created here, used level two, and then used again in level three. We haven't made that level yet. Um, so I'd probably say the environment might be better. But, I mean, there's no right answer to that. It's all down to you. Anyway, we've now got headers. We can also make them sticky. We could say to our, uh, our um, grid up here, give me those columns. Yes, but I also want to have some pinned views using dot section headers. And so coffee, tea, and cold drinks will stay fixed as the user scrolls around, like a sort of traditional uh, list style headers or if you're old school UI table view uh, headers there. Um, so that's our basic layout we have right now. We're gonna come back to improve, 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 but it's good enough for now. To see it actually work, to see it in, in action, we want to go back to content view up here and then uh, inject it somehow. So I'll just, for now, it's a little shortcut for now to get us going, replace the whole hello world thing with the whole menu view passing in as an environment object our whole menu. Just just go ahead and stick the whole thing in there. Um, just replace it with our menu. Just so we can see it working, just to get it started, just so we can see our code actually working correctly. Just jump straight to menu view. Now I'll go ahead and press Command R to build and run my code. Let's see if I've made any comedy mistakes in my typing so far. Let's find out. Uh, let's have a look. Questions galore. Do I have to have an ID and a for each? No, you don't, um, Davion. It works great without an ID. Um, every value in our data already has identifiers behind them and they conform to identifiable. So there's no extra thing required on there at all. Um, Athan Jerry asks, which one to learn, learn first, SwiftUI or UI kit? Uh, I believe SwiftUI. And I believe that because of momentum and velocity. It is so much fun building SwiftUI, you learn things so much faster than with UIKit. There's a much lower barrier to entry. And it means you get moving, you get success, you get results way faster, which feels great, it just feels so good. Okay, the code is running with no screw ups so far. And as I scroll around, you'll see the thing stays fixed and goes under like that, uh, all the way up, boom, like that. So that's our pinned headers working very nicely. And what I want to try and do for a moment is I'm going to try and fire up Keynote. Uh, and hopefully, if this is going to work correctly, I'm a bit iffy about sharing my screen uh, with Keynote when I only have one screen running on a on a, on a live stream. Um, but I'm going to try and bring up uh, this thing over here of our little quiz. And I'm going to try and play this in a window. Yes, in a window. I'm just going to work first time. And I just want to check you folks are listening. Just check you folks are listening, make sure it all works correctly. So if I press play here, hopefully you'll see a little quiz of a few things we've seen so far. Or the whole thing catches fire, you know, it's live. <laughs> quiz number one. If you could, please kindly do not post your answers into the chat window. On the first stream, I said that very, very often. And folks still post the answer into the chat thing. Let other people have a chance to respond, to think about it. They're not hard questions, but give them a chance to prompt their own memory first, particularly folks watching later on. So please do not post your answers into the chat. Thank you. Quiz number one, easy peasy. What does the identifiable protocol do? Does it give every object an ID property? Does it give every object a passport? Does it require that every object has an ID property? Or is it required that every object be different? Four options, have a little think. I'll tell you the correct answer in a few seconds. If you're watching later on, of course, you can pause, think about it, rewind a little bit. Um, there are only four options here, hopefully not too hard. And the answer is, no one's put it in the chat, win. Great, a huge upgrade from last year. The answer is, it requires every object has an ID property. It does not give you the ID property. That's down to you to declare in your struct or your class or your act or whatever you want to use. Um, but it requires it must exist. There must be an ID in there somewhere to be used. You don't have to have that. You know, you can remove identifiable and when you say for each, you can do ID colon 
some other path, name, whatever you want to, but it's easier having ID. Question one. Question two, when should we use at state object? Is it with all reference types created by a view? Is it with all reference types state not created by a view? Is it with all mutable value type state or with all reference type state? When should we use at state object? Again, do not paste your answers into the chat window. The answer is, thanks Neil. <laughs> the answer is, with all reference type state created by a view. This is a very, very easy one to get wrong. You'll be really careful here. The state object means I am making this thing, I want to keep it alive for the purpose of my view. Elsewhere, fine, observable object or environment object or something else, but when you're making the thing as a reference type, so not strings or arrays of strings or integers or whatever, otherwise you want to say at state object. Next up, when should we use at environment object? Is it value type data in the environment? Is it a reference type data in the environment? Is it a binding data in the environment? Or is it all of the above? Go ahead and have a think now. Again, you can pause the video and have a think about it. Down to you. When do you want to use at environment object? And the answer is... Boom, for reference type data in the environment. Value data shouldn't be in the environment. It can't be in the environment, right? That's that's not gonna work. You're gonna conform to observable object, and that's for classes only. Uh, binding, no, again, you wanna use uh, at state and at binding for that. Therefore, all the above's also ruled out. So by a process of elimination, we can come to option B, it's reference type data in the environment. And that should, I think, finish quiz number one. Cool. Let's pause that there and come back to our code. As a reminder, this is a charity live stream on my birthday. If you use my site, enjoy my site, there are a lot of folks out there suffering with homelessness right now and they need help. It's very, very cold out there and they do need help. Please visit justgiving.com slash two straws. You'll find a link below in the description. Uh, click on that and please donate whatever you can. Even a few dollars makes a huge difference. Plus your name will appear somewhere over there, I think, on the stream all being well. You'll see it right there. Justgiving.com slash two straws uh, and donate whatever you can. It makes a big difference to folks who are experiencing homelessness right now. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on. Code, let's show some pictures. Let's bring it to life with some illustrations. Right now it's quite dull, it's all text and so forth. This is actually fairly easy to do. Uh, back in our um, drink file here, we have the name and we have the ID, and I have very cunningly given our drinks picture names that match their names. All you gotta do is lowercase them and replace spaces with dashes. That's it. So you'll see like a uh, uh, chai latte, for example, will be uh, chai dash latte, all lowercase and then English breakfasting, lowercase, dash, and so forth. So we can get the image name from their drink name by lowercasing and replacing spaces with dashes. We can do that with a computer property called image, which returns a string. Let's use the current name, lowercase, then replacing the characters of space with dash. So lowercase the name, and replace all spaces with a dash. And that'll get us the image name. I know, Kilo, it's like a, I planned ahead. <laughs> Who knew? Um, so we have our image names here. We can get them right that. And now we can go ahead and inject them into our layout really, really easily, bringing the whole thing to life. So back in our menu view, we have, let's uh, hide this sidebar, a bit short on space here. Uh, there we go. So I'm gonna go back to this little VSAC we made, cunningly, which only had one thing in right now, we'll add another thing now. We're gonna to add to this the image for the current drink. So we'll say, I want to use image of drink.image, making it resizable with scale to fit and a corner radius of 10 points. 
So a little bit of rounding to it as we come round. And hopefully have a little think, my little preview, and maybe jump in. Perhaps press Command R. Uh, as you might imagine, streaming on a sadly Intel MacBook Pro isn't ideal, a bit, bit slow. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and so we have this. I think the whole thing looks immediately better. Boom, there we go. So we've got our copy types here, all listed alphabetically, all by section with the fixed headers and so forth, and uh, pictures now too. Eric asks, what's my favorite mechanism to catch missing resources or misspellings? Uh, yeah, so I use test coverage, really hard test coverage. Even that's as simple as literally a test to load all my JSON files. Just load them all. Don't, don't try and process them or work with them, just load them all. Because decoding them will cause a, a, a throw if you've got a bad JSON file in there, make a whole test throwing and boom, it'll, it'll cause a test to fail. Uh, I use that one quite a lot. Uh, Gopal asks, how can I give a custom height for section header? It's automatically sized according to its content. And so um, it'll be whatever size you want to. Hey, it's Ioannis. Good to meet you again online. Hooray. Thank you very much for coming along, Ioannis. Yeah, folks, if you aren't aware, he's done extraordinary work with in the past, Vapor, but also Mongo stuff. He's a, a real gem in our community. Anyway, um, images, hurrah, step forward. Even if the preview doesn't want to show it, it's definitely working. The next step is to uh, make it so that when user taps on a drink, show a new screen. How do you want to customize your drink? Do you, what kind of milk do you have? What kind of syrups do you have? Do you have extra shots in there or who knows what, right? And this is best done in a whole other Swift UI view, not in our current menu view. And so once again, we're gonna start simple and then build up, build up, build up as we go. So press Command N, make a new Swift UI view. And then call this one Customize View. So the view where they will customize their uh, drink. So again, Start as simple as we can, just to get something meaningful on the screen, then work our way up bit by bit by bit. In order to customize a drink, we've got to be told which drink we're customizing. So we'll receive a drink property of type drink. What do they choose? Cappuccino, latte, whatever. For now, we're also gonna add a little bit of state to track the size they asked for and whether it's decaffeinated or not. That affects the caffeine level, which is one of the main points of this application here. Uh, we're gonna add more here later on, but for now, step by step by step. We'll say at state private var size is zero, and at state private var is decaf is false. Now I've made size zero so we can index into an array elsewhere in the program where I'm trying to store small, medium, and large, um, or just say, just give me zero, one, or two. It'll work better on with calculations later on. Our size options will be an array of small, medium, and large, or in our internal variant, that will be zero, one, or two. We're gonna add two computed properties here, one to calculate how much caffeine is in our drink. I'll return 100 for now. We'll go ahead and customize that you know, with real code later on, but it's just fixed value for now. And also how many calories are in our drink? And again, just dummy data, a hundred calories. We'll come back to it later on with some logic to make it real, but enough for now. I'll hide the left-hand navigation view again so I can uh, see more space on my screen. This thing will have a form of data input here to work with. So we'll say there is a form. And there's a section inside there called basic options. So the, the basics of their drink they wanna work with. This thing has a picker asking for the size they want to order bound to the selection of dollar size. So we'll store zero, one or two. Now we wanna loop over small, medium and large right inside here. But remember that as zero, one and two. I don't want to track small, medium, and large in my code elsewhere. I want to track zero, one, or two. Various size numbers going bigger and smaller. And so we're going to loop over size options dot indices, the index numbers inside our array. 
Give me one of them coming in. And inside there, we'll do text of size options index. That's our first step. Now, this thing, there's only three of them. We can fit those very nicely using a picker style of segmented. So the options are going to choose from on the screen directly. We'll also, in our initial sort of draft of this screen, add a toggle. Is it decaffeinated or not? And this will be is on bound to is decaf. That's our first section. Again, we're going to add more here later on. Below that will be a second section called estimates. We're going to estimate how much caffeine, how many calories are in their drink. And we'll say it has text. Caffeine is caffeine, mg. And then text calories is calories. Like that. Oops, caffeine with an E. Like that. Now, really nice little thing in iOS 15. Um, with these kinds of text views here, you can add markdown directly to them to do things like bold or italic or uh, other formatting here. In our case, I'm going to use star star around caffeine to make that whole thing just a bit bolder below it. So there'll be caffeine in bold and a number next to it, a little bit less bold. Super simple, but it works really, really well. So there's our, uh, our little customized view to work with. We're going to pass this thing a drink to work with, which is fine because we can just say uh, your drink is drink.example. Again, previewing is very, very helpful here, having an example thing for the time you actually need it. In this case, that's a good time there. I can try and press preview, but I haven't had much luck so far with previews. Let's find out if it's going to work. I'm always so hopeful. I'm endlessly optimistic. Preview. No. Red. Red's bad. <laughs> it's trying. It's trying its best, but it's clearly not going to work. Anyway, super simple customization view. We're going to add more to it later on, but it's just enough to get us going here. With that done, we can go back to our menu view and display the customization view when they choose stuff. Uh, Gumeha asks, why don't you use an enum for the size? I mean, you could do. As long as you don't mind stringifying it, that's fine. Um, you could just use case small, medium, and large, and then use a string describing that with a capitalized to get capital S, capital M, capital L, and then use case iterable on the enum to loop over it. You could totally do it. Like I said, I've taken a few shortcuts to make it simpler here. Uh, Alex asks, what's the advantage of using Markdown instead of modifier, so font styling and formatting? Honestly, it's just easiness. I mean, you could do that with 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 directly using text, right? You could use, uh, you can't just do it here. <laughs> you could use uh, text caffeine here, put that into bold, and then use plus text, uh, what, caffeine, mg. You could do that. Of course you could. It's just ugly as heck. Um, that's so much easier to read, quite frankly, Alex. Uh, so I find it really, really nice and clear. Plus, you know, it makes it easy to do things like uh, italic or links work great too. You can just do an inline markdown style link and boom, it'll just work. It's really nice. So yeah, partly ease, partly laziness. It's just powerful stuff. Anyway. Yes, push into this. I'm going to leave that there for a moment and go back to our menu view so we can push over to this customization view when they've tapped a drink. How do you want to customize this? Uh, so I'll say in my menu view here, oh, it's so much indenting here. Uh, we have this whole V-stack of our drink here with an image and name. We're going to wrap that with a navigation link. So inside here will be a navigation link here pushing to customize view of drink, our current drink, and then use that VStack as our label, like that. So that's our label, that same thing we had before, that's label for our navigation link. So uh, go ahead and push to customize view when it's tapped. Hey, Tobias, how are you doing? Good to see you again, man. Well, I'll see you 
your name. <laughs> Obviously, nice to meet you in person one of these days. Uh, yeah, so we've now got tappable things. So I'll go ahead and press Command R. See how that looks. Hopefully, my code is uh, more or less correct. You never know with live streams. Boom. There's our Americano, Cortado, and similar. I'll choose flat white. And there we go. We've got some options uh, working very nicely here. Cool. Um, you'll notice our text has gone blue, <laughs> which isn't ideal. It doesn't really match our style. Um, we can fix that by switching to a plain button style for our navigation link. So by adding a modifier here of button style dot plain, we'll get uh, a nicer layout, I think. So let's press command R now. Give that a quick sneaky peek. And there we go. Back to being black. Actually, let's go to dark mode. I think dark mode is much nicer. There we go. Much better. Um, there we go. Okay, so it's it's better. Um, there's this large space at the top here, which isn't great. And that happens because we're still in large navigation mode. So it expects a large title at the top there. Uh, and also because we haven't put any title there right now, so you can't see anything at all. We can fix that by going back to customize view and then adding a modifier to the form up here saying uh, nav display mode is dot in line. So give me sort of skinny titles here, but also a nav title of uh, drink dot name. So it'll say cappuccino, cortado, flat white, or whatever up there. Uh, Gamut asks, is there a different way of changing the text style? There are lots of ways. <laughs> there are all sorts of ways. You can do uh, lots of things like that. Uh, it's very, very flexible. Uh, Brandon asks, does label or support markdown modifiers? That's interesting. You know, I've never tried that before. Let's find out. Label. Uh, hmm, looking like not. Text. So you see it takes attributed strings here. Um, it looks like it does with this. Um, but I'm not sure it works with uh, label. Give it a try. I mean, I don't want, only one way to find out, quite frankly. Um, I'd hope so. It'd be nice, but I haven't tried it. Anyway, we're now linking to our, our new view. It's got the right title. Let's kind of fix those early bugs, which is great. Now we can start to bring in more things from our JSON. The data is already there. All our model stuff's in place. All we're going to do is add more values to there. Give me the, how much caffeine's in here. Give me how much um, calories in this drink, whatever. Let's add more values to there. They're already in the JSON and they'll be decoded automatically for us. Very, very nice way of working, I think. So we're going to say uh, in our drink.swift file over here, let's add a bunch more properties in here. Give me caffeine which in our JSON stored an array of three items, small, medium, and large, how much caffeine is in the various types. So this will be an array of int. Then we have a Boolean called coffee-based. Does this use coffee or not? This is important because some are and some aren't, like tea, and the ones that are will show options saying, do you want extra shots of espresso in there or not? Uh, we'll say, is it served with milk or not? And this is important because some drinks like uh, espresso, for example, don't have milk by default. Other ones do have milk by default, like, you know, uh, uh, cappuccino, for example. So the milk option should be set to um, a milk, like whole milk, for example, by default. And then uh, espresso and, you know, mint tea, for example, they aren't traditionally served with milk. And so uh, they'd have false for that. You know, don't show milk selected by default. We're also going to read a base calories amount. What is the base calorie number for this drink in its simplest way? And if, you know, for mint tea, it'll be very, very low, but for a mocha, for example, it'll be much, much more. Okay, more later being deco uh, decoded. Caffeine amount, is it coffee based or not? Is it traditionally used with milk or not? And what are the base calorie levels? We've got to add that to our example so it keeps it happy. So we'll say down here, Let's hide this sidebar again. Our name is that. Our caffeine will be an array of 60, 120, 200. Uh, coffee base will be true. Serve with milk, true. And base calories, 100. Yeah, so coffee based, Michael, uh, will be used for um, do you want to add extra shots or not? 
uh, which I don't think makes sense for tea. I guess you'd extra tea bags, perhaps. If you want really, really strong Darjeeling, toss in more tea bags. Um, but no, it'll be used for uh, extra shot tracking in there. Similarly, uh, syrups. We'll be tracking syrups with coffee based. I don't think. I mean, I, I don't want to judge people. As far as I know, people don't normally ask for, you know, Earl Grey or English breakfast tea with gingerbread syrup in it. If you do, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware. It's your program. You, you customize it all you want to. Um, here, here, I'm going to assume you don't. Um, there you go. Anyway, so we're going to let cus folks customize um, a variety of things about the drink, give them real control of the kind of drink they get and how we track it. Uh, and in particular, we're going to say, what kind of milk do you plan to use? You know, is it whole milk, skim milk, semi-skim milk? Is it almond, oat, soya, coconut, or of course, none? And this is a whole other type, very simple type here that will track the name of the thing in question, oat milk, for example, but also the calories inside that, because obviously oat's quite high and almond's quite low and none is even lower. Uh, so we'll make a new Swift file here, uh, up here, and I'll call this thing a configuration option. How do you want to configure your drink? Now this thing will have a struct called configuration option, and just like before, it'll be identifiable and also codable. But this time I'm going to add one extra conformance called hashable. And that lets us put them into for reaches directly. We can for reach over an array of configuration options with hashable in place. In terms of the properties it'll have, it'll have one for an ID, another UID, already there in our data already. One for the name of the thing, so oat milk or hazelnut syrup, for example. And one for the calories in that thing. So, you know, uh, almond milk, quite low calories, vanilla syrup, quite high calories. We'll also add a none option, which will be the default for espressos, milk, and syrup, for example, no milk, no syrup. So this will have uh, the ID of UUID, name, none, calories, zero. So no milk, no uh, syrup. That's our none option. So we want to load these things as part of our menu. because It already includes these here right now in our menu. You'll see all our sections are here. But then very, very end is our milk options with whole, semi-skim, skim, the skim, all the way down the line, plus various syrups, caramel, gingerbread, gingerbread, sorry, hazelnut, and vanilla. So it's already in our JSON. And we've just defined the struct to hold it. And now we can go ahead and load that into our menu file over here. Uh, we can say we want to have a bunch of milk options and a bunch of syrup options, starting with always none, the default don't exist option. So we'll say var milk options is an array of configuration option dot none. And then var syrup options is an array of configuration option dot none. So default options are those two things at the very, very east. Uh, Boris, I do use the mouse quite a lot. Uh, I do move around quite a lot, but I do rely heavily on the keyboard, it's true. But uh, this is actually, this is, I don't ever use the other one in videos, but this is my quiet keyboard. You can see that uh, I have two identical keyboards um, and one's red keys and one's blue keys because this one has the red switches from Cherry and the other one has blue switches from Cherry, which is much nicer to type on, but honestly sounds like a machine gun when I'm typing. Uh, this thing is the quiet version, which hopefully you don't hear too much as I'm tapping away. Um, so what we're going to try and do is when we load our data from here, we want to uh, bring that in uh, to our menu. So we'll say uh, our milk options append contents of the menu data milk options. Bring them in after the none option. So none's always first in the list. And then syrup options append contents of menu data dot syrup options. <laughs> Kilo, I do not use Vim mode in Xcode. I do not hate myself that much. I'm nah, just kidding. <laughs> I don't. I just don't. I, you know, I, I learned Vim first before like Nano and Emacs and similar. 
And so I compulsively rely on it. Every time I use SSH or even locally in, on terminal editing, I don't know why. Like Nano will do the job for me perfectly well, nearly all the time with simpler options, but I just rely on my Vim knowledge. I can't get out of my brain because it's so old now. It's been in there so very, very long. Um, anyway, um, we've got some basic options being loaded now for the milk and syrup, plus the non at the top, no matter what. Our next job is to uh, bring those into our customization options. So back in customize view, we're gonna add some data to store that information. So I'll say up here, I expect to be given an environment object of our menu. So I can read the syrup options and read the milk options right here. Then I'm gonna add state to store the various customizable things we want users to be able to customize. How many extra shots they want, default will be zero. What kind of milk option do they want? It'll be none by default. What kind of syrup do they want? Again, none by default. So we'll say at state private var extra shots is zero. Or at state private var milk equals configuration option dot none. And at state private var syrup equals configuration option dot none. So a few extra options to customize what kind of drink we're actually gonna make down here. And let's go and add some layout for these. Uh, down here we have uh, our basic options. That's a great place to have extra shots, but only if our drink is caffeine based, if it's coffee, uh, coffee based, sorry. Uh, so we'll say uh, if drink dot is coffee based, oh, coffee based, sorry, coffee based. There we go. Add a stepper saying extra shots and then extra shots with a value bound to uh, dollar extra shots in the range of zero, no extra shots, or up to, I mean, I think four is the most I can imagine a human actually consuming, but I'm gonna eight. I mean, surely, surely no one will have more than eight extra shots in their coffee because basically if you're drinking tar, <laughs> uh, you just collapse with a, a cardiac arrest if you have more than that, I expect. Um, drink caffeine responsibly, folks. So I think eight's probably enough. Uh, and that's our basic options done. We'll add another section down here after basic options to add customization points. We'll say section customizations. How do you want to customize our drink? And this will be done with, with pickers. So we'll say there's a picker in here for the milk type, with a selection bound to dollar milk. And now we can just loop over our menu milk options directly. Give me one option coming in. So we're binding straight to a custom type here. In our text, we'll have our option name. But because we have an, a, a, a custom type here, it's not a simple string or an integer anymore, we've got to give a tag here for that option. So SwiftUI understands what it means when this option is chosen. It'll make the checkbox work correctly and so forth. So make sure you tag your text inside the for each uh, using the option it represents. So it knows what it means when it's selected. That's our milk option. And then again, if we are coffee based, we're gonna add options for syrup as well, using the same kind of code. Picker called syrup, syrup. And then selection will be bound to dollar syrup. Again, for each menu.syrup options, one option coming in. Text option.name, oops, dot name, with tag of that option. Hey Ben, how are you doing? Happy holidays. Ben Sherman, folks. Great website, NS Screencast. Go and check it out. Paste the link in the chat. Uh, let folks uh, check it out, Ben. Anyway, so we've now got uh, some syrup and some milk options to customize the way our thing looks. Uh, make sure you update your preview if you're using 50 y previews. Uh, so down here, you want to inject an environment object for the menu, just so it'll run correctly. Not that I've had any luck with previews today at all, but you know, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. Here we go. Yes, that's 
it's not going to work. Um, anyway, um, it's trying to work. It's amazing. It's doing its best. Uh, this screen's almost done, right? There's only really two more things missing from here. Uh, one is to add some meaningful calculations for caffeine and calories uh, here. Uh, using the if with the coffee based, should you use if visible? Uh, oh, sorry, visible. It's visible. Um, is visible. It is visible. Is visible. Oh, you mean hidden? I mean that. Is it, is it visible? Visible. Oh, it's thinking about it. Is UI alert view? Huh? I'm not sure. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure Michael is the answer on that one. Uh, you know, annoyingly, hidden doesn't take a value. It unconditionally hides a thing. There's no true or false here, which is frustrating. I think because hidden doesn't actually remove from layout, it just leaves space for it and makes it invisible, which isn't ideal, but there you go. Anyway, meaningful calculations for our caffeine and our uh, calories. Again, I said at the beginning, these are not real numbers. I have just sat and said, hmm, that seems about right for random things. So please don't use these numbers in shipping applications. We'll do that first. We'll say uh, our caffeine amount, caffeine amount, is the drink's caffeine level at our current size. So small, medium, or large, get the right caffeine level for our drink. We'll then add to the caffeine Extra shots times 60. I mean, that's about right in terms of the layout. Uh, you know, it, it, I don't know how exactly how much caffeine's in a shot, but it's about that. Up to about 90, maybe 100 of very, very strong coffees, but 60 seems about reasonable to me. We'll then say, if we asked for decaf, there is still some caffeine, just not as much. You know, we're going to say caffeine amount uh, divide equals by 20 or so. Again, about right. And then send this thing back send back caffeine amount how much our very very finger in the wind estimate is for calories we'll get back our calorie amount starts with drink dot base calories roughly how many calories in this drink because things like uh you know a mocha for example or a mocha in american english mocha um the chocolate ones they have more base calories because they have the chocolate syrup or sprinkles or whatever it is they put in the, the, these drinks to add a lot of base calories here. We'll then add a small amount of calories for the number of extra shots. Not a lot, like 10 calories per shot. So pretty, pretty small stuff, but a little bit to get it going. Now, uh, if our drink is coffee-based here, then our calorie amount will add the milk's calories to it, depending on how much calories we have in the milk as well. But if it's not, if it's a tea-based drink, then we'll do calorie amount plus equals milk.calories divided by eight. So, because basically if you have tea, you normally have lots of tea and then a little bit of milk. Whereas in a, in a latte, it's a little bit of coffee and then mostly milk. So we have all the calories for coffee-based stuff, and then a tiny bit of calories for tea-based stuff. Uh, Umar A says, um, this is my first day of 150 UI. A, welcome. Uh, I hope you're enjoying it, day one at least. Um, this will be very, very hard for you. <laughs> um, not only do you want to get through the 100 days first, at least halfway through, but you want to watch my preview videos first um, because um, I've, I've the preview, the previous video first because I go in there and say, the base of Swift, base of Swift UI, build a real app there. This kind of builds on that knowledge. It's a little bit hard to, to jump up straight to here. Ben, thank you very much. Yes, uh, there's a link, folks, by the way. It's a charity stream. Below here is a link to my Just Giving page. All the money goes straight to Julian House from there. So please donate if you can. Even a few bucks really, really helps. Calorie amount, like that. Add a little bit for the milk. And then add a whole bunch um, for our syrups calories because lots of those in there and then finally send back our calorie amount multiplied by 
size plus one. So if size is small, it'll be zero, add one to make one, our calorie amount is unchanged. If it's medium, there's, you know, twice as much drink, twice as much milk, twice as much syrup and so forth, more shots in there, double it up, whatever. And then for a large one, it's even more calories because you know, the is it venti, uh, the huge ones at Starbucks, you know, the massive buckets of coffee people drink these days, um, really bump up the calorie amount here. Again, completely fabricated numbers that might look vaguely reasonable, but please don't ship them. So hopefully now I press Command R, because my previews are just not going to work today, which is never a surprise. Um, I'll choose, let's go for a healthy-ish one, which is espresso. And I'll say uh, it's going to be medium. So I've got 180 milligrams of caffeine, and then large has 250, cool. As I add extra shots here, that goes up two, up to eight. <laughs> don't, don't drink eight extra shots of coffee, folks. Uh, there's decaf, comes right the way down. Uh, if I go into uh, milk options in here, that looks great. Oh, I've put that in the wrong thing by accident. Sorry, I think I want syrup and milk together in the same section. My mistake. That is uh, down here. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Like that. That's what I meant to do. So that's one section. Uh, so I'll say I want um, vanilla <laughs> syrup in my espresso with skim milk, so not at all an espresso. And you can see it's pretty bad for me. Um, there you go. Uh, uh, Josue says, how do you change dark mode? Shift command A toggles between light mode and dark mode in the simulator. Um, it's a really helpful shortcut that one, so I recommend you use it. Uh, what else do we have? David, earlier code. Uh, why don't you use an enum? David, you absolutely could. Uh, I've taken a number of shortcuts here <laughs> to try and make it easier to follow. Um, a, because time limited. I do want to have some time with my family this evening, if possible, it'd be my birthday. Um, but also because it's still a beginner project. So shortcut, shortcut, shortcut. Anyway, that's the first step. We've now got uh, meaningful, albeit complete lies, approximations for caffeine levels and calorie count for our drink. The second thing we want to do, and this is more work, is when they actually have finished customizing, add a save button that adds it to our data model. So it's there to be stored and come back to later on so they can see their drinking history over time and try and, you know, break five digits of caffeine, whatever the goal is in life. Uh, and this requires a whole new data type to store our drinking history. So uh, we're going to do that. We're going to add a type to store drink history and so forth. But first, we've got to think about what a particular finished drink is going to be. Because we already have this drink struct, you know, how many calories, is it milk or not, da, da, da. But that's not helpful for a finished drink. Like one actual serving of a drink is is part of that. Yeah, it's espresso, whatever. But also, what milk did they use? How many extra shots did they have? Uh, was it decaf or not? What syrup did they use, right? Other things. So it's not so we can put in struct drink. We need a different struct to store a drink serving. So press Command N, make a new Swift file, called serving.swift and this thing will store one drink serving so we'll say a struct called serving which is codable oops identifiable and codable sorry and codable here uh, and inside there uh, we'll say that it has an id uuid and a name string and a description string and caffeine, oh, caffeine, E, int, and calories, int. So it's, a, it's sort of a boiled down version of the finished result. We'll put in all their options into a simple string we can show on the screen nicely, A, comma, B, comma, C, comma, D, and then a bunch of caffeine here. Ankit asks, why use codable for ser serving? So we can save these things. We're gonna save them out so the user adds 10 copies for the day, whatever they want to, it gets written to disk straight away. So we can remember um, what they've added already. Uh, otherwise the app becomes frustrating to use because they don't remember what they've saved already. Uh, you'll notice I have made the ID variable. That's intentional because later on we're gonna add an option to reorder existing drinks. 
Give me the same drink again, please. And I'll just copy the current struct and change the ID. Armin, if you post the same message again, again, and again, I'll just hide you from the chat. Please don't do that. Thank you very much. Uh, so th that thing is variable. Everything else is constant. Next up, we can move on to loading and saving our serving history. What drinks have I ordered over time? Now, loading and saving data means knowing where to load and save data. Uh, in this case, that means finding our app's documents directory. Every app has one of these. You can read and write files there again and again and again. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, hide from the channel now, if that's all right, because you are just winding up a little bit. Uh, let's. You can be in timeout for a while. There you go. Timeout. That seems fairer to me. Uh, so we're going to say here, first up, where is my documents directory? Now, right now, on the Swift forums, the foundation team have put forward suggestions for making this much, much nicer. Much, much nicer. Um, you can get the documents directory really easily with the changes they're putting forward. Right now, we haven't got that. I'm guessing that's next WWDC. And so we've got to use some hideous old style code to do it by hand. Uh, we're going to have to have um, our custom code to find documents directory. Kilo, exactly that. Easier documents directory. It's amazing. I love it. That whole thing. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Static string URL initializer. Oh, yes, bring it on. Inject into my veins, quite frankly. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and um, write some, hopefully, temporary code. It'll go away in Swift 6 to find documents directory. Um, I'll press Command N. I'll make a new Swift file here. I'll call this thing File Manager, capital M, File Manager, dash, documents directory. File Manager, documents directory. And this thing will be an extension on the built-in file manager type. It will find the documents directory URL. So I'll say static var documents directory. Directory is a URL. Now the code is it's quite hideous. It's really, really grim, but it's the only way of doing it right now. Uh, we'll say let parts be our file manager dot default dot URLs for dot document directory in user domain mask then return path zero. Like, do not write this code yourself. Just get it online, copy and paste it, move on. It's the most ridiculously annoying, overblown code for a very simple piece of work that you've got to do in so many programs. Grr. This will be fixed in iOS 16, I guess. Anyway, that's there, like that. And now we have a place we can read and write files from. Our saved data, our encoded JSON data for our serving history, right? This is another new type. Press Command N, Swift file. This will be called history.swift. And this will be a class. We'll inject history into our environment that can be used in the home screen, but also add it to elsewhere in our program. When it finished customizing a drink, add to our history the new drink. So we'll say in here, a new class called history, called observable object. <laughs> yes, uh, I use shortcuts a lot. And the most common I use, actually, I never mentioned in, in videos, uh, it is control command left and right in the cursors to go forwards and backwards in files. I use that a lot. It's so helpful. The whole history, you can just go through everything you've done so far, forwards and backwards like that. It's really, really nice. Um, that's my most commonly used one. Anyway, uh, our history thing here. So this will have an array of servings. What are all the drinks we've had so far? We'll use at published var servings is an array of serving. What are the servings I have so far in my thing? Now, published tells the system whenever this value changes, whenever we add or remove or whatever servings from our array, notify any SwiftUI views that are watching this thing, hey, my data has changed. You probably want to reinvoke your body property, to reload your body to reflect those new pieces of data. Inside here, we'll also say our save path, where we're reading and writing files to, will be file manager dot documents directory appending path component saved drinks. And again, that's getting easier too in this proposal from foundation. It'd be really, really nice. So that's where we're going to read and write our file to is save drinks. Again, I really like it when my top-level types 
know how to load and save themselves. I just create them and they pick up automatically where they want to. It's a really, really nice way of working, I found. So I'll say there's an initializer in here that will do something very similar to what we had before for our JSON. We'll say our data is try data content of our save path. And our servings array is try JSON decoder dot decode array of serving dot self from that data. Like that. And if it goes wrong, servings is an empty array. So if we can't find the file or can't load the file, whatever, it's an empty array, no problems. So our thing now knows how to load itself back from disk. We're also gonna add a little save method in here that will uh, write data back out to disk again whenever we want to. So we'll say do let data equals try JSON encode this time to write the file, encode our servings array, and then try data.write to, and I wanna use that version there with options, write to our save path with the options being .atomic and dot complete file protection. If that goes wrong, we'll catch errors and just say uh, print unable to save data. So what we're saying here is two things. First, write our data out atomically, which means in one go. Now, in our case, we're saving very small amounts of data and it's not being read multiple places at the same time. But if you had a lot of data, like 500 megabytes of data or a gig of data, whatever, Writing it out takes time. You write 10 megs, 20 megs, 30 megs, 40 megs, do, 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 and you're finished. So at some point between starting writing and ending writing, like in the middle somewhere, it's possible your code might be to say somewhere else comes in and reads the file when it's only halfway written. Some other program comes in or some other uh, task in your particular project comes in and tries to read it halfway through. That's a problem because it's not complete, it's not valid, it's not compatible, half's missing. Atomic is very clever. It writes the whole file out to a temporary location, fully. And then in one go, renames it to be the correct file. So it's either fully written or fully not written. It's a much safer way of working. And complete file protection is an automatic thing iOS gives us, which means this file we're writing out, our saved caffeine and calories list, is only available when the user has unlocked their device, which means things like touch ID or face ID or passcode. Otherwise, it's completely encrypted by default. It's a really, really nice way of working for safety purposes. Okay, so that's published and that's writing out. Now for the trickiest part, right? We've been given a drink plus a whole bunch of customization options. We have to convert that into a serving. So we've been given, again, the name of the drink, plus extra shots, milk type, syrup type, decaf or not, yada, 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 stuff galore. We're gonna convert that to be a serving, which means remembering how much caffeine it has and how many calories it has, but most importantly, getting a good description string. Taking all the values about syrup and milk and yada, 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 and making one single string out of it that fits nicely on the screen. Uh, Bacterial Fox asks, will this work on Mac OS? <sighs> yeah, I think, I mean, maybe, no, nah, I think it's all gonna work basically. <laughs> I think it's, you might find towards the end, one thing here or two things here might not be compatible with Mac OS, but basically it's fine, so I'm not too worried. Anyway. Our job is to try and uh, convert what data into uh, a serving ready to go. So we're gonna say inside our, uh, uh, where is it? Our history class here. This is the probably the longest piece of code we're writing the entire project here. We want to add a drink. But remember, we're gonna get a bunch of options in here describing the size and the syrup options and the milk and decaffeinated and extra shots. And do, 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 do. So we're gonna pass in a whole bunch of parameters here and do something good with them. So we'll say, add the drink with a size string and an extra shots count and an is decaf bool 
and a milk configuration option and a syrup configuration option and a caffeine count and a calorie count. Uh, Kilo asks, will it be converted back to a customized drink? No, it won't. We're going to basically flatten out all their options into a single thing um, stored as a final flattened piece of data. It's just simple to work with and makes a small data as well. Okay. So we're given a bunch of stuff. We're going to kind of collapse it down to a nice, simple description describing the whole drink. So our description won't be a string. It's going to be an array of strings. And that's because we can add things to the array A plus B plus C plus D until we're done and then join all with commas. So it'll be uh, whole milk, comma, vanilla syrup, comma, two extra shots, comma, decaffeinated, whatever, da -da -da -da, nicely on the screen, which is hard to do by making a string by hand, much easier with a string array and then joining it at the very end. So first things first, we can do description, but append our size. It's small or medium or large. That's the easy part. If we are decaffeinated, then we'll append to our description the text decaffeinated. Like that. We'll then look at extra shots. If we have zero, do nothing. Easy. If we have one, we'll do description dot append one extra shot. And then if we have two description dot append uh, will be extra shots, extra shots. Wilfred says, if that is within the model layer, wouldn't it better to have an adoption of observable object which would then be kept for the view model layer? I don't even know what you're saying, Wilfred. If that is within the model layer, what is? Uh, rephrase the question, I'll have a go answering it, Wilfred. I don't quite understand, sorry. Um, anyway, um, this thing is all extra shots, so we'll just do default here. Uh, Kilo asks, isn't there a, a string formatting thing that handles pronouns? Yes, there is. It's not a beginner topic, I'm afraid, so I'm not going to cover it here. I've kept it as simple as possible, as simple as possible, and that is uh, a switch. Uh, if they added milk, track it. We'll say if milk is not equal to uh, the none case, then description.append will do uh, milk.name.lowercase and then uh, brackets milk. So it'll be almond milk, oat milk, whole milk, whatever you want to. And then uh, the same thing basically for syrup. So if, if syrup here, syrup, and um, we'll do uh, syrup name and then syrup here. Gregor, I, again, this is aimed at almost beginners to Swift, <laughs> right? I understand you might go, let's use composition. I get that, but we're just baby steps. We're working our way forward slowly, 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 and going into more advanced things really isn't going to help folks at this point in their learning path. Anyway, uh, that's syrup done. And with that, we have enough to create a whole description string describing the whole thing. We can say our description string is our description array joined separator will be comma space. And now we can put that whole thing inside a serving. That'll store the name, that string, caffeine amount, calories, and a unique identifier. So our serving is a new serving. ID is UUID. Name will be our drink's name. Description will be our description string. Caffeine, caffeine. Calories, calories. Oops, calories, calories. Calories, whoops, calories. <laughs> Site typo there. There we go. Uh, now that's a new drink they've just had. And so we're going to use servings and our array insert that serving at the index zero. So go to the top of our list of, of servings. So it's the most recently had one. Otherwise, not quite so user-friendly. 
and then call our save method. Save that new data straight away. So that now gives us the code to add one new finished configured serving to our data, which will then get saved out to disk straight away. To make it actually work, we're going to make a history instance as a, a state object when our app starts in our content view and then put it into the environment. So we're in content view. Uh, I'll say there is a content view, sorry, content views here. There's a new at state object. Var history is a history. And then add that to our current environment objects. So environment object history, like that. So we're now sending both the menu and our history into the thing, ready to be used elsewhere. And now in customize view, we're customizing our drinks. We can use that. We can say, uh, I expect to be given uh, up here somewhere. Yes, give me a menu, but also give me the environment object, environment object. Come on, that's how you can do it. There we go. Var history is a history. Okay, Wilfred's question take two. Um, do you use exclusively observable object protocol option for objects you directly observe from Swift UI? Do I use observable object protocol option for objects that you can, as opposed to what? <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's just, I wouldn't, uh, how else would you observe an object if you don't have the object? Um, I mean, yeah, I do, because environment object requires it, and observable object requires it, and state object requires it, so yeah, I do. Um, anyway, I may have misunderstood again. Um, I see, okay. Well, it's, it's not really a view model. It's not a view model. I mean, it's not really doing much with views. Um, it's not ultimately. Um, it's just a data store realistically. We're not gonna use view models here. We're just not realistically, we're just not. It's not real ones. Anyway, um, we've now got history and a menu. So now when we're ready, we can say tap save. So I'll say down here, yeah, Wilfred, I think, again, you might have misunderstood the point of the stream. <laughs> I'm not going to create multiple model objects stacking them up. Folks, <laughs> I get some of you are very, very clever, and that's awesome. I love Swift UI, and I'm glad you love Swift UI too. So many folks are learning Swift UI, and you've got to take them up step by step by step, right? It's called Wittgenstein's ladder. You're on a, a ladder trying to climb up from the bottom to the top, if you explain things at the top of the ladder straight away, it's just confusing, it doesn't help folks. You explain ladder rung one, ladder rung two, ladder rung three, four, five, and maybe when you reach five, you realize ladder rung one wasn't actually needed, and ladder rung two wasn't really fully explained properly, and ladder rung three, whatever, but it was enough to get you moving forward each time. That's what we're trying to do, get folks moving forward, trying things out, running the code, and experimenting a little bit, as opposed to going in with the most advanced, clever thing straight away. I hope that makes sense. I'm a big fan of Wittgenstein's ladder. <laughs> um, anyway, we're gonna add a save button to our uh, our form here. We already have um, this display mode and whatever down here. Um, we're gonna add a new thing, which is a toolbar uh, here. And this will have a simple button saying save. And this will just go ahead and call our history add. Massive method right now, passing in all the values from all our local state values, just pass them over there and it'll do the right thing automatically. So we'll say, pass in our drink, pass in our size options of our current size, pass in extra shots, pass in is decaf, and our milk option, and our syrup option, and our caffeine level, and our calories level. Just pass them all in. We don't really care what the history class does with them. We've got no idea what it does with them. Obviously, internally, it then makes a serving from that, which saves out and yada, yada, yada. But this view shouldn't have to care about that. It just goes, here you go. Here's the information I have for you. You do whatever you want with it. But now, 
we can save stuff, which is great. It actually works, right? We can give it a try, hopefully. If I press Command R, if I made no comedy typos in my code, I should be able to press save and have this actually work for a very precise definition of work. I'll choose Cortado, and I'll say I want a medium-sized Cortado, which doesn't exist, I don't think, uh, with two extra shots. That's decaf, uh, and milk, I'll use uh, almond milk, and syrup, I'll use <laughs> caramel syrup. Um, okay, it's really bad for me, but I'm gonna have one of those, and I'll press save, and nothing happens. I mean, things are happening, but you can't see them happening. But that's okay, we're gonna fix that shortly, after, after, quiz number two. Just to make sure you're listening so far, let's do a quick quiz of our questions so far. First up, how do you disable the blue text in our navigation links? Do you say color, disabled, no highlight or button style? Please do not post your answer in the chat. So folks watching later on can fry themselves, pause the video, have a think themselves and still benefit from these quizzes rather than seeing the answers pasted in the chat window straight away. How do you ditch the blue text in navigation links? And the answer is we used button style to say, just give me plain buttons, don't try and color them, disable them entirely, it works really nicely. Second up, what does UUID stand for? We've used it a few times so far. Is it a universally unlikely identifier? Is it an utterly unique information delivery? Is it a universally unique identification device or a universally unique identifier? Which of those four things does UUID stand for? The answer is... The last one, it's a universally unique identifier. And you can make them, by the way, you can just go ahead and launch um, Terminal on your Mac here and just type UUID gen. Boom, you get new ones, get as much as you want to. And they are very, 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 very unique. Like the chances of clashes, you could make one a second for, I think, more than a billion years and still wouldn't get a clash. The odds are still remotely tiny, tiny, tiny getting a clash. It's basically a whole long set of completely random-ish hex numbers. The only thing that is going to be constant is the number four right here. That four, you'll see all the way down, is always going to be there. But the rest are basically random numbers. And there are all sorts of... Yes? Oh, hello, show off the thing. Ooh! Cookies? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I've got cookies! <laughs> oh, not for me! <laughs> We're going to do the rest. So you're saying this, you brought up me to, to show me that I can't have cookies. <laughs> We're going to do the rest tomorrow. Well, I'm, I'm here working hard. Where's my cookies? <laughs> right, and so... And you've made some pom-poms too. Good job. Well, um, if I could have one later on, that'd be great. Sound good? <laughs> eh, kiss. Mm, love you. Okay. Right. See this? Not for you. Love it. Brilliant. Kids are great. <laughs> anyway. UUIDs. The super low chance of collision. Really, really low. They're a great choice for identifiers. Okay, back up to our questions. Which of these is a real SwiftUI protocol? Is it hashable, equitable, comparing, or identificatable? Is it hashable, equitable, comparing, or identificatable? Yeah, the Transformers shirt. If Victor, she's got a Decepticon shirt. I love it. It's like, she doesn't, she doesn't know what it means. She knows, like, it's Transformers. doesn't know they're the evil ones. They're the sneaky ones. Um, so, oh, well. Which is the real SwiftUI protocol? The answer is hashable. Equitable, of course, is equatable. Comparing is comparable. Identificatable is identifiable. Uh, Donut, they are easy questions, but only for folks who know the answers. You know, things you find easy will be harder for other folks out here, and the things they find easy will be hard for you. That's just a normal way of life. So, what does at publish do? Does it print copies of our code? Does it cause our model to be saved when it changes? Does it ensure all our models stay in sync? Or does it announce changes to SwiftUI views? 
if you are very advanced in Swift, you may have a different answer here. But for the purpose of our project, what does at published do? And the answer is, hurry up or pause if you're watching later on. The answer is, it announces changes to Swift UI views. And what will happen is, they'll go, aha, my data model has changed somehow, and therefore I should reinvoke my body property, like rerun the body property again to reflect any new changes that came in from a particular item there. So that's quiz two done. We can go back to our code. In the meantime, I want to remind you folks, today's my birthday. I'm 42 years old today. Excellent geek age, quite frankly. Um, but the reason I'm here being taunted by my children with cookies here doing a live stream is in a help out Julian House, which is a local homeless charity. They help folks who are experiencing homelessness right now. You can go to justgiving.com slash two straws. It's below. I'll put it in the chat again anyway, just to make sure folks know about it. Justgiving.com slash two straws. If you could donate some money there, it'd be fantastic. Even a, a handful of dollars, like two or three bucks, any amount really, really helps because it's horribly cold out there. With corona around, it's a really, really nasty time, particularly nasty time to be homeless. So please donate while you can. It's really, really appreciated. Anyway, that's why I'm here talking to you on my birthday rather than eating cookies, apparently, with my kids downstairs. <laughs> anyway, donate some money. Make me feel better about doing this because it doesn't matter. Anyway, it's time to go back to our content view because we've saved stuff, I think, probably works, um, but... We can't see it saved because we had a little hack early on um, back over here uh, to say, just just show our menu view immediately. Just just put the whole menu view into our content view straight away just to save some time uh, and hassle. But now we're going to go back to here and actually beef it up to have a real uh, display of our servings, but also to present our menu view inside a sheet. So we can add things easily from there um, rather than to go back and again and again and again uh, not see the home screen. So we're going to say in here as a new property uh, at state private var showing add screen is false. Are we showing the menu view right now or not? And in our body, uh, I'll just get rid of this for now. Leave the rest of there for now. There's a navigation view here with a list inside it. Now in this list, if our history servings is empty, so we've added no drinks yet at all, we'll add a really clear button saying add your first drink. And we'll have a toolbar button as well, the little plus symbol and so forth. But for that initial bit of UI, adding your first drink, adding a nice big button in the middle I can tap on helps a lot to get them started. And when that's pressed, will do showing our screen is true. But if our servings isn't empty, we'll just go ahead and list them all. We'll say there's a for each of history servings with one serving coming in. Inside there is a hstack. And it's a hstack so we can have on one side the name of the drink plus our description string. On the other side, we'll have uh, the caffeine level or you do calorie count, or try and squeeze in both if you want to. But some little summary of what's in this drink. So H factor on the left will be two things, the title of the drink, cappuccino, and then a description of the customization options below. So V stack alignment is dot leading. We'll then say, I trying to get some space here. I'm running out of space quite badly on my little screen. Let's bring that across to maybe there. There we go. Uh, we'll say as a text of our serving name with a headline font, then a serving description uh, with a caption font, so a bit smaller. That's our V stack. Uh, after that, we'll say as a spacer to push the rest of the things to the trading edge of the screen. Then we'll say as a text of, come on you, uh, serving.caffeine. MG. So how much caffeine's in that particular serving? Uh, we then, for our uh, list down here, down this one here, we add a bunch of modifiers. 
One will be to show the sheet, show the sheet, when uh, showing as screen is true. So we'll say uh, sheet is presented, dollar showing as screen, content is menu view dot init. So create and show a menu view inside the sheet. That's what it's saying there. We have a title, nav title, and there we go, will be cool beans. We have a toolbar, so we can add uh, items from a toolbar directly. So it'll be a button saying showing ad screen is true with a label of label. Come on, Hudson. There we go. Let's scroll out a little bit. Label add new drink system image plus little plus oh, plus icon. Uh, and then we want to make sure we inject both the history and menu into the environment for our navigation view. So anything else you might present later on, they're all in the environment. Everything inside here, any new views you push and pop, they're all in the environment all the way down the line. And now hopefully the app will actually work. Let's press Command R and uh, give it a try, see how it looks. There we go. There's a Cortado I added earlier. Medium, decaf, extra shots, almond milk, caramel syrup, um, 50 milligrams of coffee apparently. Oh, it's decaf, that's why. Let's add another one up here. Uh, I'll choose uh, a latte with one extra shot, medium size. Milk will be mm, oat milk. Syrup, mm, caramel. <laughs> uh, whoo yeah, it's pretty bad. Anyway, save, and it's not great, I've hit save. I go away and there we go, there's our latte. Medium extra oat milk caramel syrup, 180 milligrams of caffeine. So it's working really nicely. The app actually works now. You can add drinks and see them appear in the home screen brilliantly. It's not perfect. As you saw when I press save, it didn't do anything. I had to sort of swipe away by hand. Um, and so we're gonna try and add some fixes here. Now, normally, if this were a simpler application, we would go to uh, our customized view and say, okay, when they've pressed save, dismiss the thing, dismiss the view. So we'd say up here, uh, I want to add uh, an environment value for the dismiss action, var dismiss, and then call that down in our save. So add the thing here and then call dismiss, right? We'd normally do that. And SwiftUI works this way, it's very, very clever because normally views know how to dismiss themselves based on their presentation. We don't say, like you do in UI kit, pop view controller or dismiss view controller animated or whatever you want to. Uh, we don't do that. Instead, we say, hey environment, you tell me how I should be dismissed and then dismiss myself. However, that doesn't work right. As you'll see, if you press Command R, it doesn't quite do the, the thing we want here. So I'll run the code back again. And I'll add another drink. I'll just choose a cappuccino and press save straight away. Boom. And it saved it and dismissed the view and gone back to our add drink view. So even though it's appeared there, you can see our cappuccino is right there, it still left the main view active, which is not what we want to do, right? We want to actually dismiss the whole thing, get rid of the, the whole sheet, just go away. And so we can't just call dismiss. And, you know, don't try and cheat by saying, you know, dismiss, dismiss. <coughs> that isn't going to work either. So I will not work that way. You, you just can't do that. Instead, what we've got to do is tell our parent view, the one that presented us, I have finished now. You dismiss yourself. So the thing that's the top level of our sheet, which in our case is the menu view, please dismiss yourself. And so what you want to do is move this dismiss action out from customize view. Get out of there and instead put that into menu view. So menu view knows how to dismiss itself. And instead, our customize view will be given a custom closure called dismiss, which will take no parameters and return void. It'll call this thing when it's ready to be dismissed. Now, when you do that, you have to update your preview code down here to pass in just an, like an empty 
thing here, right? It's fine. Nothing at all is fine. It's just an empty closure so it knows it can be dismissed. It's only preview purposes. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the point is, when we have uh, this thing in place, we're now saying, call my dismiss action, whatever that might be, not the systems one, call a custom one that was passed in. Because over in our menu view, when we create our customized view here, we're now gonna pass in a trailing closure. When this thing says to dismiss itself, call my dismiss action. So before we had customized view saying, call the environment dismiss. Now we have customized view calling menu view and menu view calls the environment dismiss because it will dismiss the whole sheet. We're dismissing the menu view rather than dismissing the customized view like this. And hopefully with that change there, I can build them on our code again. Uh, Maxim doesn't like Swift UI. <laughs> Good luck getting a job in five years, Maxim. <laughs> Honestly, um, press plus, then press uh, flat white, and I'll press save, and boom, the whole thing now goes away, which is much, much nicer. That's what we wanted all along. At this point, the app mostly works, right? We're almost there. We'll make a handful of small improvements just to make it polished. First, I want to make our menu searchable because right now, uh, it's nice, you can see teas and lattes and stuff, but in a real cafe, there'd be stacks of options here. There'd be, you know, long black, long white, flat black, whatever. There's all sorts of options here, plus food and water and sparkling drinks, whatever, 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 whatever. Lots of options here. It'd be nice to have this whole thing being searchable. It's a great example of where Maxim will realize actually UI kit's pretty flaky compared to Swift UI because making a UI search controller is nasty, 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 nasty. It's much nicer than Swift UI. I've been a real chef's kiss job up here for doing this kind of work. Anyway, we're going to add searchability to our program here. First up, we're going to go ahead and modify our uh, sections over here. So they know how to be filtered. Only show me drinks that match some kind of search. So I'll say up here, we've got a new method called matches for a search string and it return an array of drinks. First things first, we're gonna trim out all the white space from that search string. Trimming characters in white spaces. And if that string is now empty, return the whole drinks array. The whole drinks array goes back. So by default, give them all the drinks. If we're hit, still here, we'll do return drinks.filter. So our array of drinks filtered where $0.name.localized case insensitive contains. Super long method name, but it works very nicely. Search for search. So look for search case insensitively based on whatever is the localized language they're using on their device. So return all the drinks that match their search string. And now our sections can be filtered somehow. So over in menu view, we're gonna add, let's get up some space again. I'll get rid of the whole preview pane and take up too much space, folks. Um, I'm gonna add some new state to track the thing I'm searching for right now. So I'll say we have at state, private var search text is an empty string. So no search text by default. We'll then add a modifier to make this whole view here searchable. So I'll say down here, that's our title. This view is searchable with a text being dollar search text. Ah, good. I see the uh, YouTube spammers have arrived. You can just go away. They got a whole view searchable. And now we can go ahead and uh, use that for our section content. Because right now we're showing all the drinks, right? We don't want that. We're gonna do section.matches for search text. Show me only the drinks in your section that match the thing we're searching for right now. And that's all it takes to uh, go ahead and make this whole thing searchable, to filter out our views. So I'll press Command-R to build and run. 
I'll press plus. I should see, there's our view. If I just pull down slightly, there's our search box. I can now try something like a, let's search for, oh, not the on-screen keyboard. Get rid of that, <laughs> I've got patience for that. Come on, give me a regular keyboard, there we go. I'll search for latte. Beautiful, just works immediately. And honestly, that's a real pain in the backside to do in uh, uh, UIKit, but trivial in SwiftUI, I love it. Most of our work is basically making our filtering thing work nicely, but that's data you'd have to do no matter what. The actual SwiftUI part is brilliant. I love searchable deep in my heart. Anyway, we can now filter our stuff here. Oh, did I, not, did I, did I use the wrong string, Mohammed? Sorry, what did I do? Oh yeah, good point. Trim, thank you. There we go. Thanks, Mohammed. you're right. That should have been trim rather than um, search. So strip out any white space. If it's then empty, just send back all the array. Otherwise, give me the filtered version. So go through all the drinks and return a new array of items that match the method localized case in terms of contains that trimmed string. So we have filtering in place now to handle searching, which is really, really nice. A small tweak, but I like it. Another small tweak we're gonna make is when we go to customize view um, over here, if I choose, um, go away searching, if I choose uh, espresso, milk's none, syrup's none, yada, yada, that makes sense, right? But if I choose cappuccino, the default milk is no milk. And that's not cappuccino. <laughs> that's espresso. Or maybe Americano, perhaps. Diluted espresso. Um, but the rest of these drinks mostly have milk involved. Not all, you know, um, Darjeeling or uh, green tea, I'm sure is hideous with milk. Earl Grey, some folks put milk in, but you really ought not to. And mint tea, of course, would be hideous with milk. Uh, and so what we want to do is, is just put a little, little shim in place to say, actually, if they've chosen a milk-based drink, if it prefers having milk in this drink, just go ahead and change none to a sensible alternative. There are various ways of doing this, various nice ways of doing this, but they're all a bit tricky for beginners. And so the simplest way of doing it I've found is to, uh, in our... Uh, customize view over here. What we're going to do is we'll say when this view is shown, when on a peer is called in SwiftUI parlance, if we need milk, just choose the next milk option down, which is whole milk by default. And that's done with an on a peer. On a peer. If drink is served, or uh, served with milk, sorry, there we go, milk equals menu.milk options one. Go from none to whole milk. That's the simplest way of doing it. Now there is a hiccup here, which is frustrating, uh, which is that on a peer is called whenever the view peers. And so if you go into the picker and then choose almond, for example, um, on a peer is called again. Now, because you've gone back to the view again, on a peer is recalled. And so it'll reset the milk every single time, which is frustrating. And so what we want to do really is only run this code if it's our first appearance of this particular view. And so, again, the simplest way of solving this is to add some new state uh, up here. To say, is this uh, private var is first appearance? And it was, sorry, true by default. Yes, it's the first appearance of the view here. And now inside on appear, we can say only do this code if it is the first appearance. Uh, Brandon Tyler, you're looking for the 100 days of Swift UI, which walks you through the beginner Swift and more with challenges and tests and milestones and so much more. Perhaps someone can link the 100 days Swift UI in the chat for me, be helpful. So now in our on appear code down here, we're going to check guard is first appearance else return and set it down here to be is first appearance is false. So this code will only run once when the view is first shown, jump along and select milk for milk based drinks. Hopefully now uh, I have the JSON, I believe is correct with milk as standard. And so drinks like espresso should not have milk by default, but cappuccino, boom. So we have whole milk by default for cappuccino and then Americano uh, has whole milk as well. And espresso, has no milk. And hopefully the T's are all correct, let's find out. 
Uh, so chai latte has whole milk, good. And uh, Earl Grey has no milk, good. Notice how syrups and extra shot, boom, just gone. Not even there. Love it. Uh, the third change I want to make is over here in our content view, I want to show a summary, like a high score table, how much coffee um, do I want to include here? Uh, so uh, great question from Kiloco. Why not use initializer? You're absolutely right. Initializer is super tricky here because uh, first up, this thing has to be given a closure to work with. And that requires knowledge of at escaping. When you have a property, it automatically knows it's escaping. When you have an initializer, it doesn't. You've got to use at escaping by default. So that's another whole thing to explain. And also, the initializer would cause problems because we want to try and read our menu environment object. And that won't be available when our code, uh, our struct is being initialized. Like the environment exists, but it hasn't been connected to our view just yet. It's still initializing the struct. And so, uh, trying to read the environment object in initializer is a bad idea. So, we've got that problem plus the escaping stuff. It's just, yeah, no, it's extra hassle for beginners, quite frankly. It's already two minutes, uh, 10 minutes past seven. We've been going two hours, 10 minutes. Um, so, we're going to whiz straight past that onto much easier solutions. Anyway, a summary. So, you can get a high score table of how many thousands of milligrams of caffeine you have had today, or this month, or this year, hopefully. And so, Back in content view, over here, we're gonna add two new properties up here, both computed. One is total caffeine, this is an int. And this is gonna go ahead and get all our history servings and use map. Now map lets you transform all the elements in an array from one type to another type. In our case, I'm gonna say map to caffeine, which means this will be an array of all the caffeine levels in our drinks. So we've gone from all our servings as an array to just the caffeine levels in those servings. Once we have caffeine levels, we can say reduce, which means boil this array down to a single value. And it wants to know two things. What's your starting point? For us is zero, because we start counting from zero. And then how do we handle joining two items? The answer is plus. So add all the caffeine levels up, starting from zero, and return the whole value back to here. We'll then do the same for total calories. Int. So history dot servings dot map calories. Reduce zero plus. So give me all the calories and all the caffeine for our drinks. And now we've got our summary data. So we can add a new section inside our list up here. We can say a section called summary. Let's do text, caffeine, total caffeine, mg, and then text, calories, total calories. Um, Gregor asks, is there an advantage to using computer properties versus functions, apart from being slightly small syntax? Yeah, I am lazy, it's true. Uh, SwiftUI uses properties for its body, and so I prefer to honor that. Uh, we don't know how often or when body will be called, and so it's got to be lightning fast, really, really fast. And so... I prefer to make it really clear I'm doing simple work like transforming an array and adding things together. That simple work, that's a computer property that makes sense. Same for um, caffeine. If I was doing complex work, you know, it, it took a, a tenth second or longer to run, for example, fine, I would have a function for that, cache it somehow and call it carefully. Um, but for quick stuff, properties make sense. You'll occasionally see folks say, big O notation, they'll say, well, you know, if it's O1, if it's constant time, uh, then yeah, it should be a property, otherwise it should be a function. Um, and that's really iffy ground beyond because O1, a constant time, just means it runs the same amount of time no matter what. It doesn't say how long it's going to be. It could always run at 10 seconds, for example. That's constant time. <laughs> that's O1. But I wouldn't make that a property. I'd make that a function. <laughs> um, uh, so it's, it's all about context, really. Anyway, so now um, we should see a summary 
of my hideous coffee addiction lifetime bang calories and caffeine printed here uh, which is very nice the final improvement we're going to make before we're done because it's already quarter past seven i've kept you for two and a quarter hours already despite speaking very very quickly is we're going to add some swipe actions to our table down here so we can swipe to say i've had another one of those my favorite drink is a uh medium decaf extra shot almond whatever drink reorder that thing please um, and therefore, it'll be easy to reorder that. But also, uh, whoops, that was a mistake. I didn't drink that. It got cold, whatever. Come on, then. Um, delete it. So we can add deleting as well as reordering. So that's both done in history down uh, here with two new methods. One, to reorder a particular serving. Uh, serving. I want the same thing again. So we'll say, first up, get a copy of that serving. It's a struct, so to copy the values across straight away. But give the copy a new UUID. It was variable for a reason. All the other values stay the same. Change the ID so it's unique in our list. Otherwise, SwiftUI would be very upset indeed. We have the same thing or the same ID twice. Be a bad idea. Good dog. And then insert that in our servings array. Servings, insert that copy i do see you i do feel the pause being scratched out for extra treats copy you get food all the time you know you get food all the time you do you do so hungry um enter that at position zero and then of course save our changes save boom so that now we can reorder particularly drinks we have a lot for ease of use but also we'll add a delete option too where are you going <laughs> You're not that hungry. Um, I delete option two. So we'll say, uh, funk, delete a serving. Serving. And here, we're going to say, first, where is this in our array? Where does it appear? So we'll say, if let index equals our servings dot first index of serving, servings dot remove at that index and call save and that code won't quite work it'll complain because first index of only works when your type on our serving type conforms to the equatable protocol but it's a struct structs in my opinion should always conform to equatable if they hold data and so we'll say you conform to equatable like that and it'll do the rest for us it'll compare id name description caffeine and calories in that order of course, ID will be different straight away, so it'll just short circuit and ignore the rest, which is nice. But it's very efficient. And now our code will compile again. Come on, then. Mm. So hungry. <laughs> so hungry. Do you know my dog's name, by the way? Do you know this one's name? Can you recognize them on camera? She's the very, very hungry one. Appears all the time on camera, asking for treats all the time. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. She's a bit bigger. She's a bit whiter. And a bit cheekier, a bit hungrier than the other one. This one is called Arya. Good guess, Mora. This one is called Arya uh, after Game of Thrones. Uh, the other one's called Luna. Uh, both our dogs were rehomed and we didn't choose those names. And it caused a real geek problem for me because in the TV show, they pronounce or have them pronounce Arya as Arya, Arya Stark. And I wanted to call her Arya after the TV show, but she responds to Aria because that's what her previous family called her. And so uh, we're stuck with Aria. Anyway, uh, the equatorial protocol is being used right here in first index of. We only get that if our type conforms to equatable. Because it's got to be able to use equals equals. It goes through all the items and says, are you the thing? Equals equals? Nope, 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 nope. Oh, you are. Return true. Or return the index, sorry. All right, this is the last one, yes? Last one. Agreed? Yes? And you get. Um, so it's used right there. You've got to use that equatable protocol to get first index off. So we can now delete stuff. And with that in mind, we can go back to content view and add a swipe action to our row, which is this H stack right here. No, no, no. That was your last one. That was your last one. No more. Go away now. Enough. Go. 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 Go, 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 go,
Um, Tim H asks, why is there a space here? Do we not have the, is that the title right now? I don't remember. Plus, add drink. Oh, I see what you mean. I, I think it's because it's putting a toolbar up here, perhaps, to uh, dismiss it automatically. But um, we don't have one here. Anyway, uh, go away. Where was I? Ah, oh, yes. Swipe actions. So these are really nice in Swift UI because you just say dot swipe actions. Then provide a whole bunch of buttons. So I'll say there's a button here with a roll of dot destructive. So it's a it's a dangerous button. Uh, and when it's pressed, we'll do with animation history dot delete our current serving. And the label will be label delete system image of trash. Like that. So that's our delete button. And after that, I'll add another one button uh, with animation history dot reorder that serving. And then the label for this will be a label. This one's Luna. <laughs> See if you can spot the difference. Come on, Luna. It's a little bit smaller. She's a bit, a bit, bit more rare on camera. She's a bit less hungry, apparently. Um, and a little bit more biscuit colored around the face and the back of her, you don't see her body too much, but the back of her body is a bit more biscuit colored. Anyway, label repeat. System image is repeat. And this thing I'll give a tint of blue. So there's no tint for the previous one because it's a destructive button. iOS knows, destructive, make the whole thing red and scary looking, fine. Um, this one down here needs to have uh, the custom label. I've made a mistake, whoops, lazy. There, it should be like labeled like that. My mistake, sorry. Too much dog action going on. <laughs> um, that'll be happier. Uh, Neil asks, what breed are they? They're called Samoyed. Samoyed. They're like huskies, just white. They love to pull though. They love pulling stuff like huskies do. So they're interesting to walk and very, very stubborn. Anyway, swipe action. So we have these things here. And what it means is you can add as many as you want. Literally as many of these as you want even beyond the amount of screen base you have, all buttons you want, left edge, right edge, full on swipe across the way, it's down to you, they're very, very customizable things here. And with that in place, all being well, at only 21 minutes past seven, we are almost close to finishing. So I'll swipe across here, there are our buttons, I'll choose a reorder, and boom, another flat white appears. So I'll choose a reorder my latte, there we go, a new latte appears, cappuccino, boom, there we go. So it's really, really nice. So I can go ahead and delete stuff. Hopefully, boom, goes away. Delete, there we go. So it's actually working very, very nicely. And that is where we're gonna finish our app at only two hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> um, but before we're done, there is still time for SwiftUI quiz number three. First up, presenting one view over another uses Alert, sheet, confirmation dialog, or message box. Alert, sheet, confirmation dialog, or message box. Do not print your answer in the chat window. Let folks, William, <laughs> do not print the answer in the chat window. <laughs> do not. Folks are gonna follow along later on and hopefully try it themselves, pause the video, have a little think about it. And if you paste the answer in there, it denies them that opportunity. So uh, please do not put the answer in the chat window. The answer is sheet. Next up, we can screen out items from an array using filter, map, reduce, or first index. Which method screens out items from an array? Is it filter, map, reduce, or first index? Have a think. If you're watching later on, go ahead and pause the video. And the answer is filter. How many swipe actions can a list row have? Is it none? Is it two? Is it five? Or is it infinite? How many swipe actions? That's those buttons we added earlier. Can a list row have? Basically infinite. <laughs> you can just keep on adding them. Put them in groups if you want to have more than 10. You'll run out of screen space. iOS is like, yeah, it's fine. Just carry on adding them in there. Not a problem. How can we add a search box to a view? Is it search? Is it searching? Is it search box or is it searchable? Which modifier adds a search box to a view? Prathamesh, it's a 10 view limit, but you can add groups. 
Now, groups of groups. Now, groups of groups of groups. You really want to. Don't. <laughs> now, anything more than three is probably having a bit of a laugh. You can use left and right uh, swipe actions if you need to. How do you have a search box to a view? Yeah, yeah thanks, Ronnie. <laughs> Don't put your answers in the chat. And it's searchable. And with that, we come to the end of the live stream. Please, it's a charity live stream raising money for folks who are experiencing homelessness right now. If you can, even a few bucks, go to https con slash slash justgiving.com slash two straws. That URL there donates money straight to a local homeless shelter who do a really critical job. Today's the first day of winter for the Northern Hemisphere. It's really cold out there. If you can give a few bucks, please visit justgiving.com slash two straws and contribute some money. Thank you so much. It's my birthday. Think of it a birthday gift for me. <laughs> um, just, just for me, uh, a few extra bucks for folks in need. It'd be really, really grateful. Thank you so much. If you want to take this app further, go for it. Uh, Neil, yes, it is. It's, it's, it's based here in my hometown, Bath. If you want to go further, remember, this is not the real data. This is just made up data by me. It looks approximately correct. Check the real data is correct first. But then think about, I know it sounds awful, gamifying it. You know, how much did you have today? Add a little date entry to your service as well and break down your home view by day by day by day and how much you earn in the cafe and so forth. So you can, you can uh, um, really gamify drinking coffee to death if you want to. Um, but there's so much more you can do with this. And if you enjoy the stream, subscribe, hit like, leave some nice comments. It'd be really, really nice. I'd appreciate that a lot. Uh, I release a lot of videos teaching Swift and Swift UI completely free, as many as I can, free of charge. So subscribe, check it out, hopefully enjoy it. But above all, please give some money to charity. You know, we're all in a very, very privileged position. Uh, even like five bucks really goes a long way to helping someone get off the streets this winter time. So that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Uh, I'll hang around to answer the question just briefly. Uh, and then otherwise, I hope you have a really, really happy Christmas time or happy holidays if you don't celebrate. Some time off. Get away from it all. Spend some time with your family. I certainly will be doing that tonight, with, apparently with cookies, apparently. Um, uh, and have a great time because it's an important time of the year with your family. So I hope you do that. Okay. Questions while I'm still here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Charity, great. Love it very much. Thank you very much, folks. It means a lot to me. Visit the site daily. Good. That's good to hear. Thanks, William. Uh, Prathamesh, uh, Prathamesh, sorry. How do you come up with these example apps of stream holidays? <laughs> oh, um, Prathamesh, the answer is brute force. I write very, very large amounts of Swift code every day, all day, most of the time, I'm just writing Swift code, just throwing code out there, refining, 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 and then saying, yeah, this works. I can teach this or no, burn it. I sometimes lose whole days on projects I didn't, didn't like with a bad project. But that's the only way I feel confident. Like I've done my absolute best. I've put it into Xcode, refine it, refine, 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 refine. It exactly the way I want it. And then if it works, because uh, it's not just working, like obviously the code runs, right? But is it teachable? Are the results interesting and useful? Could it be made into a real app? Because anyone could make a really complicated app, right? But this is a thing designed for beginners or almost beginners. So making it easily teachable understandable is really important uh, and so it takes some time and takes a lot of coding but that's part of the fun uh seb asks could i explain what tag does um sure thing uh where do i use tag it was in customize view so let's take it out for a second so you can see what it looks without it i'll zap off tag here and here and run our code again just so you can kind of see what it's doing. So I'll press plus and then choose uh, a cappuccino. And you see how milk has nothing here and syrup has nothing here. If I choose milk now, even though none was selected by default, it's not checked. I press coconut, nothing happens. It does not understand anymore what skimmed means or what coconut means. So what it's saying is we're making the rows or the options for our segmented picker, whatever we're doing, making the options for our picker, we're saying this text view, vanilla, whatever it is, actually under the hood is 
our option? Is our milk option? Is that struct behind the scenes? So it's attaching the struct to our text. Tap on one thing, make it work. And when you add tag, tag back in again, you will see the milk option display correctly and you'll see selecting it shows a checkbox and dismiss the view and all that kind of nice stuff out of the box. So it understands what whole milk means and what no syrup means and so forth. It all now works correctly. So it's kind of connecting up our struct to our layout. That makes sense. Uh, the sister, thank you so much for your donation. It's really, really important. Thank you. Honestly, it's really, really generous coming along and uh, supporting folks who need it. So great. You know, trust me, I love talking about Swift. I love talking about Swift UI. I want to help our community as much as I possibly can. I love doing it, right? But I want my work to go beyond our community, right? You know, if you're making iOS apps, you've got an iPhone and a MacBook Pro, whatever, brilliant. You are already in the top 10% rich in the world, right? There are a lot of folks out there who are in a much worse state who need our help. And I want whatever platform I've been given to help support beyond our community too. So yeah, love Swift, love Swift UI, but I'll make a difference as well to folks who are needed. Uh, Jean or Jean uh, asks, have you tried to build an app with Swift Playgrounds? I have, I've got a whole video about that, which is great fun because um, I was in the car, in a warning, in the passenger seat of a car, driving up to see my, my parents because um, they're not very well right now. And uh, I was in the car and it's like, so Playgrounds 4 is out. I'm like, oh, drat. <laughs> but I kind of knew it was coming because, you know, it said end of year. And there's not many days left. So I, I packed an old microphone and a single studio light in the car to my parents' house. And I'm like, hi, mom. Hi, dad. Bye. <laughs> straight into a spare room. Set up, record my thing straight away, making a, a project with Swift Playground. It's already on YouTube and on my site. Um, go check it out if you want to. Building a full app from scratch in Swift Playgrounds 4 for iPad. So go and check that out. Um, uh, Jonathan, how do I write so many eBooks? Get a, get a good keyboard. <laughs> Honestly, I, where is it? There's one over here, if I dare move it with my stream stuff going right now. This is my good keyboard that I use for, for actual writing stuff, this thing, blah, here, the blue version of my other one. Uh, and it, if I press the keys in here, you might even hear it. Yeah, it's a it's a cherry blue switcher, so it's quite loud, but it's really, really fast for typing. I love it. And so it kind of keeps up with my brain. You know, I'm thinking, I'm like, ah, oh, to do this thing, do this thing. Da, 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 da. It's the only way I can keep up is with this kind of keyboard. And so um, I write a lot of books. <laughs> so I, I enjoy writing. It's fun. You know, I also want to share it with them and other folks. Ah, but, 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 uh, Leonardo asks, will the code be available for us to study afterwards? Yeah, sure, I can put it online. I can just share the zip file on my site if you want to. It's fine. I'll put the link in the description afterwards uh, when the video is available to the zip file. Um, William, will I ever tackle SwiftUI and JSON web tokens? No. I can, I can rule that out pretty quickly. Uh, what's my favorite secret sauce to give some apps some spice? <sighs> you know, I understand where you're coming from. You want your app to stand out and look unique. Um, I think the key for many people is just to use the built-in Swift UI components to make the very most you can from pickers and forms and environment objects and similar because where so many of us fall down isn't the design, it's in the execution. And that's partly because, you know, our, our fundamental app idea is, isn't isn't great, but the navigation isn't brilliant or the usability isn't great. And that's not really a design thing, it's about usability, right? But also, so many folks forget accessibility. Does my app work great with voiceover or switch control or uh, with uh, the reduce animation mode or with colorblind users or whatever. And I would encourage folks just to back away from a secret source thing and instead spend more time getting a great voiceover experience for your uh, layouts, because it'd be much, much nicer, I think. So uh, yeah, maybe consider that instead. Perry, yes, it's all covered in my 100 days of Swift UI course, which is entirely free online. It's project-based, it has tutorials, it has um challenges it has milestones it has quizzes 
as videos galore on YouTube, plus text articles attached to it, plus downloadable projects. It's packed and it's completely free. It's completely free online. Um, and perhaps someone else can folks uh, can post the uh, link in the chat window. Be helpful. Uh, do I have any plans for live streams outside of Plus? No, I don't. Honestly, I talk about this very, very rarely. I'm very tired right now. Um, I am updating the 100 days course to iOS 15, which means recording hundreds of videos from scratch uh, with all the new stuff changes for async await and uh, iOS 15 and so forth. It's a lot of work recording, exporting, uploading, da -da -da -da, rewriting as well, fixing all the new features and stuff. It's a lot of work. So I am very, very tired right now. And I'm even doing another stream on my birthday rather than having a day off. Um, I'm tired. And so, no, I really have no more plans for bringing in extra live streams at this time because I, I'm already pushing myself a little bit too hard, quite frankly. Ah, uh, Flex Engineering. Are the live streams advanced topics? No, the live streams are like this one. We build an app from scratch every time. And uh, can I show you what it looks like? Can I see like Safari here somewhere? Uh, Hacking Surf Plus, live streams. So the first one was a game. Uh, second one was a how to make customizable fireworks effects. Then we had another one about um, decoding stuff. And uh, most recently we made a drawing app from scratch um, with documents and iCloud and undo and redo and more. Um, no, they're always, let's build an app from scratch every time. And so it is uh, not advanced. There is, there's advanced stuff elsewhere in here. You know, advanced Swift's full of stuff, for example. Um, but um, no, they're just, they're just for fun. Let's just build an app, see where it takes us and learn things along the way. And we build a simple AI here. We use Canvas here. We use other kinds of things here. Oh yeah, algorithms, love that stuff. Anyway, so no, it's not advanced stuff. Uh, questions galore. Um, what I'm looking forward to in Swift 6 and iOS 16? Um, so Swift 6, well, either of them, I'm guessing will include the new foundation improvements for URL construction. I'm tired of having to force unwrap URL strings that I've hand typed. That is fixed in uh, the proposed foundation changes for iOS 16. It's lovely. Um, that's nice. Uh, and the new documents directory stuff will be in there as well. I guess it's mostly Swift UI stuff. I want to see more Swift UI features. I want to say things like, how do I add a text field to an alert? That's really, really common. Like when you enter a Wi-Fi password in, you know, iOS, it's a alert pops up with a text field inside. How do I do that? You know, I'd love to be able to do that kind of thing. So I'm afraid there's more features. <laughs> more. Get to work, you Swift UI team. You're obviously bored over there in Cupertino right now. Get to work. <laughs> Um, do I ever do Mac app dev? Yeah, I do lots of Mac app dev. I've got, I've got possibly the biggest open source um, Mac app out there. You've got a GitHub, two straws, uh, control room. This thing here is a gigantic Mac OS app I've written with Swift UI, with help from other folks, uh, which controls the iOS simulator. It's really, really nice. Um, so you can set the clock and enable networking and drag in files and send notifications and da 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 all through um, uh, Mac OS app, and it's open source and very, very powerful, completely free, all Swift UI as well. I do lots of Mac OS code when I can. Um, Prathamesh, do I know what's coming up in Diversity in Swift? Yes, is the answer. I'm not gonna tell you, sorry, it's, it's confidential. Um, the answer is yes. <sighs> ba -ba -ba -ba. Will Luna and Aria get Christmas hats? No, they won't. They're getting better than that, and there'll be a picture soon. I guess 24th, maybe? We're gonna, we're, we're, there'll be something special with the dogs. Don't worry, it's going to happen. Uh, Juan asks, will it be more Alpha Portfolio? Yes, there will. I know I'm behind. Um, I'm, I'm trying my best. The 100 days thing is really, yeah, it's hard. It's <laughs> it's hard. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get that as, done as much as I can right now. And when that's done, I'll be free and I can get back to doing real work again or at least paid work again because I do a lot <laughs> I do so much of my work is unpaid I'm like I love it it's great I want to help everybody but I don't earn any money from doing 100 days I don't earn any money from doing live streams and so at some point I'm going to try and pay my mortgage <laughs> and look after my kids and stuff uh, and so yes there, there'll be more ultimate portfolio stuff coming hopefully soon uh, what is the iOS version I'd use iOS 15 don't even think about 14 at this point you're starting a new app today do 14 yeah 15 sorry because by the time you ship it in, you know, nine months' time, 
16 will be about to arrive, so I really wouldn't worry too much. Uh, I can't hang on too much longer, folks. It is 7.40 at this point. I do want to get some dinner at the very least. Um, coming back, if, for example, history requires another opportunity working, and that already has some state, would he's at publish get notified or combine? Um, so in, in that particular case, I'd use combine um, right at published. At published, I only prefer for very, very simple things. I actually prefer using um, object will change send rather than at published most of the time. Not all times, most of the time. I didn't want to go into that here because it's another layer of guff to get through. Uh, Greg. Yeah, so structs and classes really matters. And it's interesting because in UI kit, we used classes for our views and structs for our data. And so for UI, it's classes for data and structs for views. It's kind of flipped around, uh, which is uh, obviously great fun. <laughs> um, so uh, it's important to understand. And honestly, if you can, you want to use structs everywhere as much as you can. Struct, 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 struct. Really, if I wanted to get into something else here, would have a conversation about actually um, should history be a class at all? Because it's an observable object, which is why it's a class. So it can go into the environment, but should it be in the environment? Should it be a singleton? Whole other thing to discuss, not for here. That's beyond the level of this discussion right now. So not here, but broadly speaking, start with a struct. <laughs> That's where you want to start. Right, folks, that is now 7.40. I'm going to sign off now. Thank you so much for coming along. One last plea. If you've enjoyed this, had a good time, if you've learned something, donate what you can, please. Justgiving.com slash two straws. It means a lot to me, and you're directly helping folks experiencing homelessness right now as winter begins here in Bath. It's very, very cold outside. It's not very friendly. A little bit of light, a little bit of uh, help and support goes a very, very long way. If you can, please donate justgiving.com slash two straws. If you have further questions, if you enjoyed the stream, subscribe, hit like, leave a comment, perhaps even tweet about it, even better. <laughs> uh, I'd like that very much. Thanks for coming, folks. I'll hopefully see you on Twitter shortly. Take care.